It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. Ben Thompson from Stratechery joins Larry Maggot and Brian Brushwood. We'll talk about the week's news. Microsoft Surface Pro 3, it's here. Is it time to kill it? That's what Ben says. Amazon behaving badly and eBay under attack. It's all coming up next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by CashFly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twit, This Week in Tech, episode 459, recorded May 25th, 2014. Plaudits and Brickbets. This Week in Tech is brought to you by Jira, an Atlassian product. Jira is the project management solution for teams planning, building, and launching great products. To learn more about Jira and try it free for 30 days, visit Atlassian.com slash twit. And by Harry's. For guys who want a great shave experience for a fraction of what you're paying now, go to Harry's.com. You'll get $5 off your first purchase by entering the code TWIT5 when you check out. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code TWIT. And by NatureBox, where you can order great-tasting, healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy, delicious treats like apple pie oat clusters. <laughs> to get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. And because it's Memorial Day weekend, none of the regulars are here. <laughs> I'm a regular. <laughs> We're the Irregulars, right? No, it's I the mean, Irregulars, starting with Brian we're the, Brushwood. Uh, the, the Keller Street? The uh, Keller, the Street the Keller Street Irregulars. 140B I'm, I'm Keller Street, yep. Yeah. It's nice to see you, Brian. Uh, Dude, I'm so thrilled that uh, that I am your last uh, ditch date for this <laughs> evening, Leo. <laughs> Thank you for calling me last night. Don't minute. people, don't tell, don't tell. <laughs> anyway, it's nice to have you on. Brian is a professional magician. Yeah. You can book him at, what is it, schwood.com? Schwood.com, yeah. Uh, yeah. He also uh, sells uh, scam stuff online. And this is the, it's kind of nice, one of the few online stores where they actually admit that the stuff they're selling is a scam. Oh, my God, dude. Do you, uh, real quick. Uh, normally, this is at the end of the show. Real quick, we have a hat that will put a man in the hospital. If you go to scamstuff.com, it's called the Rogue's Revenge. It is a hat with buckshot sewn into the back. So that if you get attacked, you whip off your hat, you grab the bill like a handle, and you beat the crap out of the guy hitting you, and you send him to the hospital. That's special. It's adorable. It's a it's, plus it's one a defense, family. two times attack multiplier. <laughs> it has, uh, it has a, that's amazing. So it's basically a weapon. Hat. Sure. Uh, I mean, uh, legally, I don't think I should. Did you, uh, do you, did you design but, uh, this? Did you make this yourself, or was this something you found? And you decided no, to sell to your the, friends. The, the, we, we partnered with a company called Shomer Tech that makes uh, self-defense uh, stuff. And, uh, and and what we did was we took their existing product and we added... Uh, buckshot. I don't know. Some, some <laughs> Yeah, buckshot. <laughs> we, uh, we weaponized their stuff, sir. <laughs> and it has, of course, the Brushwood logo on it. Brian also, uh, is hey, host of Scam School. Let's talk about the tech news. Let's We're going to get to that. Besides the I haven't even things. introduced. I haven't even introduced the rest of the team here. Uh, but it's good to have you once again, Brian. And thank you for uh, stopping by. Scam stuff. Stuff got uh, com. Scam stuff. Scam Scam stuff. Twenty-three is our new school. website. And cord killers, which is uh, yep. seen on most of these same. Internets. You can find us on the interwebs. Courtkillers.com. And yeah. I'm not done. You also do, what else do you do? Night Attack, Scam School, Weird Things Podcast. I forgot Night Attack. That used to be one of ours, didn't it? Uh, I know. I, was it? <laughs> I don't remember. It's weird. Night, right. NSFW has spun off into Night Attack. Is it nightattack.com? Yeah, it's basically, a uh, Night Attack is basically NSFW with a billion more curse words. It is not nightattack.com, though. Whew. 
Uh, let's Not close that page. Uh, <laughs> also welcoming from Stratechery, a guy I've been trying to get on the show for a long time. He is in Taiwan where it is 6 in the morning right now. Uh, ben Thompson. It's great to have you, Ben. Welcome. Well, it's great to be here. Ben has his own uh, podcast, which he uh, does. Uh, is it is it weekly called Exponent or Ex yep, yep. Exponent? And uh, he, I, I really became aware of Ben because of his blog, and I've been reading it religiously. It is really uh, the name is good. It is tech strategy, stratechery, and some <laughs> of the most insightful uh, posts about tech, the tech world, tech news. Really, really excellent stuff. So I'm glad to get you on. Well, formerly uh, employee with uh, Matt Mullenweg at Automatic. That's the the folks the uh, business arm of uh, WordPress. Uh, he's also worked at uh, Apple and Microsoft, where he worked on Windows, Windows 8. 8. Did you work under, um, what's his name? <laughs> Sinofsky. Uh, Steven Sinofsky. He, he who shall not be yeah. named? Uh, very, very far down under. Okay. Um, so you didn't, you, you no, weren't. I, I think he knows who I am now, but he didn't, well, I worked there. You weren't I exposed. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> you weren't exposed to him at the time. Yeah, must have been interesting. I'd love to hear stories. We, we, we'll get to that about uh, about Windows 8 development. But let me introduce also our third panel member, and of course, the great Larry Maggot of CBS Radio, regular on uh, Twitch. It's great to have you, Larry. It's it's always fun to be here, Larry. Yeah, we like having you on the show. Yeah, I just came in from Paris last night, so if I, seem, if I start dozing off, a little jet lag. Gosh, we have world travelers. Larry's yeah. in Silicon Valley, but fresh off Paris. Ben is in Taiwan, and Brian Brushwood is in the... People's Republic of Austin. <laughs> Austin, I'm going to be there in, in next month. Yeah, we should hang out. Nice town. Yeah, Absolutely. I love Austin, dude. Uh, Austin is uh, is is it's amazing to watch how similar Austin's explosion has been to uh, to the Bay Area, you know, to uh, San Francisco and so on. Yeah, okay. in your Good dreams, you traffic jams. Rushwood, in your dreams. <laughs> so this week, Microsoft announced Surface Pro 3, the third Surface in 18 months. Yep. And uh, while the reviews have been mostly positive, I think the only negative thing I saw was that battery life was a little bit disappointing. It's thinner, it's faster, it, it's running uh, the current high-end Intel fourth-generation uh, core processors. Um, it is pricey, and Microsoft pretty much admitted, we're going to just, we don't want to you know, eat the low end. We want to keep a vital ecosystem of OEMs. So we're going to go at the high end. We are aiming to be exactly the same as a comparable Apple Macintosh laptop. All right. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, I actually think this is a smart decision for them to make, but uh, understand like, like I'm, I'm on the outside of this. I haven't read all of this stuff. So, so you could tell me like, they're definitely not trying to compete with the iPad market because the first generation of Surface very much looked like, hey, man, it's an iPad with a keyboard. Uh, whereas this sounds, from what I've heard so far, like they're definitely trying to compete with the yeah. laptop market instead. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, what, well, they, all, they always had optional keyboards, but this one's got, what do they call it, the friction keyboard, so you can actually hold it in your lap and, and the and the. Uh, it's very much like the collapse. original type keyboard, but it has a few little yeah. extra... But but the other thing about the keyboard, I haven't tested the new one, but all of the type keyboards they've had are still a little smaller than your than your standard keyboard. So for those of us who touch really type very fast, uh, it's a little bit of a problem having a, a slightly smaller keyboard. I would, I well, that's this, why this I use one is Mac, a little bigger. Mac Air, and the and the trackpad's bigger too. Ben, uh, you play bigger. Have you played with it, Ben? Or no, no, I haven't. Yeah, um, I, I I have an original, but not not the third one. Um, yeah, I think uh, it. It all depends on the context that you look at it with. I mean, it, it compared to the other surfaces, I think it's a good product. Um, I think there is a niche that is interested in this in this sort of product. I think the the bigger picture is looking at the program as a whole, as compared to looking at one any individual product. Well, the challenge and you wrote the article uh, the day after the announcement. It's time to kill Surface, uh, in your words. Um, the the problem Microsoft has is that this is the Surface is their first hardware. They've never made PCs. They changed uh, uh, that long term strategy a year and a half ago, um, risking their relationships with all the other Windows uh, hardware manufacturers. Plus, um, you know, kind of muddying the waters. And they said, "Well, we want to make a machine that is as good as Windows can be." Um, I do feel like I kind of agree with you, Brian, that they kind of are 
are less focused on the on the uh, tablet these days, and really you're kind of making a laptop computer almost with a with a, a minimally re removable keyboard. Why do you think, Ben? It's time to kill the Surface, though. What what's the issue? Well, I think you just kind of articulated it. Is is uh, I feel like the again, in, if you look at it in a in a vacuum, the move to focus on it being more of a laptop, a a laptop with tablet features, makes a lot of sense. It's yeah. a much more, I think coherent product now than it than it was before um the problem is 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 in the process of having a new product and a new goal and a new niche uh you're by definition forgetting the original goals of the entire program and and it happens to be that the new product and the new goals actually defeat the original purposes of the product in the first place and i think it's a classic example of um, you're kind of a sunk cost. You're thinking about, well, how do we make this better? And you forget, why do we even have this in the first place? If you step back and look at why do we even have it in the first place, then you realize, ooh, maybe we're, we're actually already pretty far down the wrong path and we're continuing to go down it and maybe it's best to, to step back and reconsider the whole thing. You're so saying was, Surface made sense when Windows 8 first came out. Uh, I think it was there. There was definite arguments on both sides when it came out, but there was definitely a case to be made, both from a product and a business sort of standpoint. Um, now, like uh, I don't, I think that case is gone and it's existing because Surface exists. And right. so, if you look at like, oh, we're making Surface, how do we make it better? Then it's a great product. I think it, it improves in a lot of ways. But if you look at it as why do we have the Surface program at all? Um, I, then that's where I have, that's well, where I, I have I think the key, problems with it. The key question is, is, do we really want a laptop that can convert into a tablet, which in a sense is what it is, right? It's, it's not a particularly viable tablet. If, if you were going out and you wanted the tablet and you wanted to occasionally type, I'm not sure that's what you'd get. And if no. you wanted the laptop that you would use as a laptop, wouldn't you be better off with a MacBook Air or one of the good Acers or the many excellent small laptops that are in the market? I mean, my Mac Air... Sure, it's a little heavier, but not significantly heavier than what, what what they're offering, and it's it's I think a better laptop. Now it's not a tablet, but yeah, well, I think, on the I other think hand, that, that, so, that, yeah. so that's exactly the point, though. It's like, uh, um, yeah, if you go back to kind of first principles, the very premise of Windows Eight, and the way I frame it is, Surface is the physical manifestation of Windows Eight. Like the very premise is that people want a one device that does both. And right. I exactly. think that premise, premise is exactly. flawed. Yeah, um, it was right. what was wrong with Windows 8 was it was this right. hodgepodge of touch and desktop. You know, right. personally, well, that, yeah. I, I well, just assumed travel with a small laptop and a seven inch tablet. So I've got both. <laughs> And and I use them in different different situations, different you know, scenarios. I, I, I'm and, and I'm, I'm sure Brian and, and will have something to say about this, but I think the tablet's dead. I think that people are choosing either to bring a mobile device, a, a phone with them. Or a laptop, and nobody needs this thing in the middle anymore. And iPad Man. sales okay, have slowed first of all, dramatically. You're, 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 oh, if only we could Le die Le so Leo, you're, you're, <laughs> you are a hundred percent right in that the worst place to get into is the mushy middle. The mushy middle yep. between two different objects is not a good place to launch a product because the natural order of brands and for things is to diverge constantly. Right. So in that regard, try this on for size. Right now, keep in mind, I haven't seen this device. I don't know what it looks like or whatever. Let me hype, uh, hypothesize about why this might be a good play. Why should you have to see it to talk about it? I think go right ahead. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. You don't need to know anything about it. Just okay. <laughs> welcome to this weekend. Tech, right? um, the uh, uh, he, here's what hypothetically might be smart about this is the way Surface 1.0 was launched was here's another tablet that has an attachable keyboard. The way they're launching Surface 3.0 is here's a laptop with a detachable keyboard. Right, right. And that Essentially. might be really smart, right? Because yeah. it's like, it's like, uh, if a- It's a subtle honest, difference, but, I, it's I think, a, but it is, uh, I think, closer to what the market's looking for, frankly. Well, and plus also, I, I, I suspect that they are identifying a segment of the market that is underserved. Like nobody who edits photos, nobody who- is editing videos is using their iPad to do it, right? It's a uh, they're using their laptop if they're going to use any kind of mobile device whatsoever. So if you have what ostensibly is one of those content creation devices instead of a content consumption device, 
And, you know, what, you know, whatever you, you just frame the existence of a keyboard slightly differently. I think that might be a really smart play on Microsoft's part. Yeah. Remember, the first Surface lost Microsoft $900 million. They took an, right. almost a billion dollars. Which, by the way, is less than the Xbox lost Microsoft. Microsoft <laughs> lost X, uh, on, on Xbox. Right. They lost a billion dollars. Yeah. Which turned out to well, be I, an okay I, thing when they had the next two iterations. Right. Well, if it makes you feel better. I basically indirectly said in the article they should kill Xbox too. But, uh, <laughs> no, but I think, actually, I think the, the, actually, the most I of the drumbeat is spin off Xbox, right? Stephen yeah, Elop like and it. others have said, let's just spin this thing off. Well, I, I think I think Brian's right though, um, and that's what I mean by if you look at the product in isolation, I, I, it, I think it's a good product. Uh, they there, I believe there is a niche that prefers, um, or I'm, there has to be a niche that prefers <laughs> this sort of combination. Right. Um, the problem though is by making it the product it ought to be, you're destroying the business case for the entire program. And that's what I get at by saying Microsoft ought to kill it. It's not that it's a bad product and it's not that they, they're not doing the right thing in isolation. It's that by doing the right thing in isolation, they are losing the story in the very big picture about why the entire thing exists. They're winning the Man, battle, I'm so glad you put it that way because yeah. there are so many times where there's been the right product, a, a genuinely good product, but they didn't have the right story to back it. And I like the fact that you're framing it as a story-based decision. Of all companies, you'd think Microsoft would understand its business better than anybody else. But I think part well, of this well, is a the, misunderstanding of why people buy Windows. Well, that's part of it. And it's also, uh, I, I'm not sure if that's true. That's why I actually used Xbox in the article itself because I think Xbox is, I, I used Xbox to illustrate it because I think it's actually easier to understand. Um, you know, Xbox, the reason the an Xbox exists in the first place is that Microsoft wanted to own the living room. Right. And owning the living room means everyone has an Xbox, right. not just gamers. Right. But Xbox now is only, you know, you saw them cutting the Kinect last week, which was kind of right. like the last the last bit about re reaching out to everyone with it as an entertainment system, it's now just about gamers. Like they've lost the plot right. in, in the big picture. And that's the same thing that's happening with Surface, in my opinion. I, I also feel like um, you, you actually like in the Surface, I think this is pretty apt to the HTC One, a gorgeous device, beautifully made, but but aimed at a market that barely exists. That is a niche, a, a tiny niche market, high-end hardware. Uh, whereas people right. buy Windows either because it's really cheap. And I'll tell you what, I hear this all the time on the radio show. I need a $300 computer. Yeah. Uh, or they're in business and they use Windows as a power tool, as a truck to do uh, spreadsheets. And they're buying desktop Dells. Keep, or, keep in or mind or also, Leo, laptop, there's a, there's a third laptop. element where I believe that there's a significant number of people who are buying it because it's familiar. Like, quite simply, it's, this is what I know how but, to do. But it's I not have familiar. time or energy to put into Yeah, then learning. they get one and they don't know how but, to use it. It, <laughs> it would exactly have been familiar right. if they didn't. No, no offense, Ben, but if they hadn't come out with Windows 8, it would have been familiar. But they've changed the user face, the interface to the point where it's not familiar to most people anymore. So if you're going to invest in a, in a Windows 8 touchscreen, you've got to learn the Metro interface. I realize it's not brain surgery, but you are, you are changing the, the, the paradigm a bit. And I think that's a problem as well because it's not your father's Windows. And your father's Windows actually works. I mean, I, I have no problems with Windows 7. It works great on the desktop. It works great on yep. laptops. And no, and no, no offense taken. I, I'm, I completely agree. Just because you worked okay. on it doesn't mean you. It's because it's your fault. It's your fault. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, had I had I made had I made uh, every decision that that was important to Windows 8, um, then you'd take you the know, blame. Yeah. Well, you know, it's well, funny. No, if I, Microsoft, I, I that would be yeah, completely free. There wouldn't be a membership program or along those <laughs> lines. I would, I would be, uh, I'd be self-sufficient yeah, financially. The, the irony least. is, the irony is, Microsoft gives you a laptop, you know, with a removable. I'm sorry, a, a laptop with a removable keyboard or a tablet with an attachable keyboard, however you want to look at it. And then they give you Windows 8 and they essentially force you into an interface. They, I mean, yes, there are ways to get around it and go back to the Windows 7 interface, but they made it really hard. And so where they could have easily created an operating system that would have been actually all things to all people uh, in the Windows world, they didn't. But then they tried to create hardware that's all things to all people, which is kind of ironic. I mean I mean, the tough thing, Larry, is that that we've seen examples of, uh, you know, for example, with what, uh, uh, you know, Apple made some extraordinarily bold decisions with the way they created mm -hmm. their iOS uh, ecosystem, where yep. they said, yes, yes, everyone says they want this, everyone's wrong, and then they, they went forward. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know that I want to pull that tool out of uh, Microsoft's hands 
just because they they may not have hit the mark quite the way that Apple did, you know? Well, they well, lost the difference, that though, is iOS, iOS was a new product. Um, it, it was a new category. Uh, I think what, you know the issue with with Windows is it was it's a known category. It's a very large category. Right. Um, and you know the the if there is an analogy on the Apple side, it's it's something like iOS seven. Um, but even then, like from an actual like the way you use it standpoint, it was a very very small change. Nothing comparable to what Windows eight kind of uh, inflicted on the on the Windows user base. And it's interesting. This is, this is actually a really good point you make, Ben, because uh, the natural state of things is to constantly diverge. Um, and I've talked about this before, but it's like, um, you know, as as Origin of the Species said, you know, there wasn't a morphing or coming together of monkey that turned into a man. Instead, there was this constant divergence and all these, uh, you know, some thrive, some died. Uh, but but eventually you had this thread that led from, you know, from from a chimpanzee to a human or whatever. Uh, and And likewise... I wonder if the mistake here for Microsoft is not so much that they're trying to enter the space, but the mistake is that they're using the the Windows name with it, right? I mean, I mean it could 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 it be that simply this is a branding problem? Hey, Chad, well, focus that, on that, this that, Mac that was, for that a was second. The whole, when, yeah. well, go ahead. So, I mean, what what you've got here is what are they called? Launchpad, nobody, which is nobody an uses nobody the Mac is, that way. What I are you doing? Had, I know. I had to go out. I actually had to search around. I actually forgot how to bring it up because I don't I've even. Never used I, it. It, it's is the, the point is that, iOS interface the on, a, they, on a desktop. Yeah. But the point is, they made it really optional. It's kind of it's almost hidden. Yeah. I mean, it's there, right? If you really want it, you can have it. But they didn't force it down your throats, and and that's I like that. I mean, if they want to put it there, fine. I don't. I never use it. I, I literally had to kind of hunt around for the icon. Yeah. But the the fact is, Microsoft essentially shoves. Metro down your throat, and and Apple just kind of put it off in the side. You know who I loves? Think Apple, hope more people would use you it. You know who loves the Surface Pro Three, the creator of Penny Arcade. This is the niche market. Uh, G C W Gabriel Gabe says it does everything right. It's light. I love the kickstand. It's just what I've been craving. Of course, he's drawing a cartoon on this thing. The pen, yeah, is great. I have to say this: if you know who the market is, if you use OneNote, this is the ideal OneNote device. It was made to use OneNote. You click the pen, the computer comes on and launches OneNote. You can write into it. It's, I mean, it is like a, a smart tablet. But I, I, I have to say, it doesn't feel like something that uh, I could recommend to people. If they're in the market for Windows, I'm going to send them to an Acer. I'm going to send them to a Lenovo. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. I just, it's hard for me, especially at the price. Now it starts at 800 bucks for an i3 based. If you get the top of the line, it's, it's two thousand dollars. Wow. And then you have to add a hundred twenty nine dollar keyboard. The keyboard doesn't come right. with it. So I mean, do, uh, Leo, do you think this is the kind of thing where it's like they almost would have benefited if they had made the price? And uh, forgive me, I'm sure a bunch of people will be angry that I'm even saying this. But but is this the kind of thing where they could have enjoyed uh, a a better market position if they had made the price even higher? Like like <laughs> what, by, understand like 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 the higher what? you make your price, the more exclusive. I mean, it worked for Apple, yeah. right? I mean, App, Apple definitely no, but overcharges. The, but they are at Apple pricing. No, but they are now at Apple pricing. They're Apple pricing. Well, yeah. I, that's the point. With is, the keyboard, that, more it, actually more than I mean, more than Apple pricing. Are you keyboard. saying they should go more than Apple pricing? Well, no, I weirdly, think, I think, I think right. yes. Like I that. think they should. I think they should do. Should something they make it out of solid gold? I mean, the, the problem is when you match Apple's pricing and you match Apple's margins, yeah, you lose. all you're doing is saying you lose. we are a pale imitation of yeah. Apple. No, that's what right. What they need to do if they want to set themselves apart is they should figure out something a little bit extra that, you know, whatever effort it takes or whatever license it requires them to buy and instead, uh, you know, take that and, and, and set themselves apart. If you want to make the credible claim that you're better than Apple, it seems to me... Maybe you should charge more than Apple, and well, that's what they're. But not you doing. have to be better than Apple, not just charge more. <laughs> no, not just you market don't. Yourself. No, you that's don't. The problem. Uh, Larry, ben, oh, ben agrees. Ben, you agree? That's well, nonsense. Well, no, I no. think for for Gabe Newell, um, the a service is better than Apple. What? Uh, 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 not Gabe Newell. Sorry. Uh, um, oh, uh, C.W. Uh, Gabriel, the uh, uh, Penny yes, Arcade. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh Gabe Newell. I don't know how Gabe Newell feels about this, but I'm thinking he's going Linux. I don't think he's he's a big fan of the Windows 8, as I remember. That's a tiny makeup problem that we falsely attribute to Gabe Newell. Gabe Newell loves the Surface Pro 3. Yeah, I worked. I worked in the. So I worked on the team that that was getting apps for the App Store and. We were very familiar with Gabe Newell's position on oh, Windows he 8. He was very negative, as I remember. Um, 
Yeah, so no, but I think for if you're CW Gabriel, uh, the Surface is better than Windows 8. Uh, that's that's and that's what's good about the current product. Is wait a minute, it's it better than Windows 8? It's no, it's better, it's better than, than the Mac. It's okay, better than yeah, any Apple for product, that niche. an iPad or a MacBook. Yeah. Uh, the problem though is that how many people like CW Gabriel, right. and when you get to that point, the kind of the whole economics of why the program exists, uh, you know, kind of falls apart. I mean, the problem is Windows. It actually it goes back to your tablet point. Uh, Windows was petrified. Uh, Microsoft was petrified of what the iPads seemed to be doing to computers, and uh, and you know felt that this entire thing is going away sooner or later. Uh, and I think what Windows 8 was was really a, a an attempt to pull the pull everything forward. It's I like agree. we're gonna we're gonna double down now. I agree. If because if you think about it, if Windows had been successful, if they had been able to successfully frame Windows 8 as being a tablet alternative, but you get everything all at once, um, we would be sitting here seeing like the one of the greatest business decisions ever. And the problem is, you know, anything with huge upside like Windows 8 had. By definition, has huge downside. I mean, that's so, the that's the idea of taking. A, you well, talk about and, Vegas and, and the pre-show. Think, that's think, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, I, th I think I think Ben nailed it. Right? It's like if what you want to do um, is position yourself as a game changer, you can't do that if you're the company that is also the establishment. Right? Microsoft is the establishment, which meant that the market was wide open for Apple to be the game changer. To me, it you feels can't like be Microsoft the and also be the it, the game changer. It feels like Microsoft is the dog that just woke up. And it sees Apple and it, like its tail and it starts to chase its tail and then it starts going in a circle because it can't catch up. In fact, what's happened is it chased Apple, but the lay of the land suddenly changed. Even Apple had the rug out pulled out from under it on uh, tablets, I think. Uh, it, you well, cannot you chase. You have to lead if you're going to be in this marketplace, I think. Well, I think big picture, too. I mean, I, I, I almost felt felt bad writing this article because I've written, um, as you might expect, a fair bit about Microsoft. It's certainly been a very newsworthy year. Uh, and the reality is I think the company broadly is doing really great stuff right now, um, particularly when it comes to their cloud their cloud efforts. Cloud is the and future. Their, yeah, yeah, and, and, they're, and the yeah. way they're, they're treating uh, iOS, uh, Android to some extent, but especially iOS as a first- as a first class pl platform where they're developing directly on it now. Uh, so they're doing lots of great stuff. And I feel like the entire surface program is a bit of a vestige of the, of the previous administration uh, that they, they have all this capability. They've hired all these people. They have all these plants and stuff like that. And it's, I'm worried it's slipping into it's continuing to exist because it exists and it doesn't really fit with the really great work that the rest of the company is doing in the way the company has really shifted direction in other places. And, and this whole conversation, um, just, you know, Microsoft had a great run of two to three months of everyone being really positive on where they were going. And the point, the fact we spent 20 minutes talking about what they're doing wrong, I think is, is kind of emblematic of what, of what makes the, the whole thing unfortunate. Well, welcome, I mean, I, welcome I, I, to Microsoft's so, so. world. Satya Nadella has been trying to change things. I think this could be something he inherited and is not, I mean, he clearly understands enterprise and the cloud. That's where he came from. And by all accounts, he killed the Surface Mini. That's um, the, which... this is what I was just about to bring up. So they all all rumors and Paul and Mary Jo Foley, Paul Throughout, Mary Jo Foley on our Windows Weekly show said our sources were very clear. There was a there was a Mini, there was mm -hmm. a what is it eight inch Surface running Windows RT. They were going to announce it. In fact, this event, if you look at the invite for the event, it mentioned what a, a little thing or something like that. And uh, mm -hmm. it, it was very clear that this was going to be a Surface Mini event and that something happened. And so it's your opinion that Satya looked at it and said, we're not going to release it now or we're not going to release it ever? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the specifics are, are unclear. Apparently, some combination of Nadella and, and, and Elop. Um, yeah, Stephen Elop but, involved because he's the devices guy. Yeah, the, the, the question is, is it delayed or is it is it killed? My understanding... Um, it's unclear, but it was it was definitely uh, I I suspect it's killed. Uh, is it? Does that mean RT is killed? Yeah, right. I think that's that's probably part of it. Like, wow. do we want to continue um, as opposed to? Wow. I mean, the long term goal is to unify Windows Phone and RT. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they kind of launched as separate is a whole nother, um That's another you know two thousand words I could write very easily, uh, but. I suspect they're waiting for that unification to be done 
before they watch anything in the space, if at all. And right now you have the like the fifteen twenty by Lumia, which is already like seven inches. So they're they're Six, already but it's beautiful. Almost, I love it. Yeah, they're almost there as it is. Yeah, and in fact, so so that's the, that's the phone that convinced me that there's no point in having a tablet. No, well, I mean, and, and of course, there's rumors that uh, you know that that iOS is going to have a a a you know a, I don't know a, a what do they call them phablets whatever that stupid name is. I don't know. Is. I the, think that's a bogus rumor, but uh, but we'll see. Well, what you, about okay, things like regardless. no? Uh, we what can, about I, reading, we watching like, movies, Leo? I mean, I mean, to me, no. for my tablet is basically a, a consumption machine. Reading, watching movies, I tend to do it on either a Mac, uh, an iPad Mini, or a uh, seven-inch Google tablet. I mean, you know, I, I, but I wouldn't spend a fortune for one. Of well, those, that's the but question. I, I do use it How that. important is it that you have that size device? Uh, are if you going to go buy here, one just not, for that? Well, I think Amazon's smart by pricing them at about a, look, just over a hundred bucks. The, the, what is it? Kindle fire started about 130. Yeah, but I, if I'm going to read books, I would rather have a Kindle paper white. If I'm going to watch movies, I can watch it on my phone. If you hold the phone Dude, close, got, it's just... Uh, my 10-year-old yeah. is deeply, deeply in love with her paper white. It, it is true magic to her. Like, That's like, a much like better reading experience than any tablet. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Well, this is... But, you're kind of getting at the whole Windows 8 problem, I think, is uh, Windows 8 supposes that everyone's top priority is, is carrying as few devices as possible. And the problem is that's true when it comes to a phone, right? We only have a few pockets. But when it comes to actual, like, if we have the luxury of using multiple devices, well, it's it's often best to use the best device for the job. And if if your top priority is not having one device, if it's having the best device, right. uh, then the whole Windows 8 premise falls apart. And I think, that's I think I think you're hundred percent right, Ben. And I think that 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 what you're describing is like the number one most pervasive myth in anybody in the marketing world. Uh, outside of the clock radio, there's been virtually no devices. And then think about this. The, outside and the phone. of the clock radio, there's been no devices where combining crap has worked out. Like uh the uh the only time that you have devices that happen to combine things that they've worked is when they define a brand new category completely for themselves. And that's what we saw with the iPhone. The iPhone was not, even though they pitched it as it's an iPhone, it's a communications device, it's the best, you know, uh, iPod we've ever done. Um, uh, that was the uh, ostensible claim. But in fact, what they did was they created a brand new category of device and they own that category. It's divergence. You want to see divergence, not mm. convergence. And uh, what we've seen so far from Microsoft has been Convergence, and I think that's a mistake on their part. Well, we're going to break. We're going to break. Radio, what's it, there's a synergy between a clock and a radio. I mean, a clock radio makes sense because it wakes you up with music. I mean, so it's not as if it's Who really a clock radio anymore. Well, now you use your phone to wake you up. <laughs> I, I Does back, anybody I back, have a uh, clock from radio? The chat, well, from the chat, I have to give credit. They, people are pointing out that also the Spork. The Spork is the other convergence. Well, also the multifunction, the multifunction well, no, printer it's, scanner. It's, it's, it's the constraint, right? Like the reason why the phone, there's that great picture floating around where there's like 10 items and then it shows one iPhone. But that's because there is a constraint of a pocket. Uh, and when I'm right. walking around, it has to fit in there. But w if I'm carrying a laptop, by definition, I at least have a bag. And now that constraint is much looser and mm -hmm. uh, it's much easier to carry two things. I yeah. like having a phone and a laptop. I think that's it. I don't know, necessarily carry that laptop with me. Um, I think you need a computer. I think you need a phone. I don't think there's anything much in between. Except a clock radio, which apparently every single person in the chat room <laughs> still has. It's fine. What? I'm I shocked. Have one somewhere. I thought that was like, you know, clock radio? Really? I'm that's, right next to my VCR. Yeah. It's. I mean, think about how many things that that, that people players. tried to invent by combining those two things together, and think about how ridiculous that's been in the long run. The, you know, it's the, like the camel is a horse dividing. designed by a committee. <laughs> exactly. Right. And I will end that conversation on that. Now we're going to come back and talk. There's lots more, uh, and then I'm really glad that uh, you're here with us uh, today, Ben uh, Thompson from Stratechery, all the way from Taiwan, where it is very early morning. But we made him get up early because well, it's, it's still seven now, so it's getting a little. Better. It's getting later. It's cool still. And, of course, he has the best Skype connection of anybody here. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to point that well, out. Well, if you want to talk about, uh, yeah, broadband. You know, I, the, the best thing about being in Europe last week is that I had the best phone service that I've had in a long time because I was outside the United States. My phone actually worked. Yeah, no, I have 100, I have 100 megabytes down, and I pay $30 up. a month. Shut Amazing. up. Shut up. We will talk about net neutrality. We had a big conversation last 
time Brian Brush was on about three or four weeks like, ago. Is it? Hold on. Are we all measuring our wieners right here? I've got 300 megabits down. Oh, Eat shut that, up, asshole. He's got fiber now. This poor this guy. <laughs> that's, he's got sorry. fiber. AT and T. Nice. AT and T preemptively striking back against yeah. uh, uh, Google. Google. Do fiber. you have gigabit? No, no, no. Well, uh, what AT and T did is like uh, uh, Google announced they were coming to uh, right. Austin, right. and technically we're outside of the Austin city limits, and so. Uh, I, I thought I was screwed, but preemptively, AT and T has said, "Well, we'll show you. We'll offer our gigabit. Uh, I don't know. They have some stupid name for it, but basically, it's it's 300 gigabits or 300 300 wow. megabits net down now, and then over the summer, they allegedly will upgrade us to gigabit. It must be we'll fiber see. though, right? It's not, is it fiber yeah, to the no, house? No, it's all fiber fiber to the curb. And, and what do they charge for that? Uh, uh, there's two versions of it. They have they claim what they what they promote is it's only seven dollars or seventy dollars a month if you do oh. internet preferences. However, when you look into what internet preferences, I'm doing air quotes for the audio what listeners. What does that mean? Internet preferences is uh oh wait oh yeah BT Dubs. We're going to track all of your traffic. Oh. see every oh. set website right. you go to and serve you right. tailored ads to you. It's ad uh, subsidized, basically. You'll save you'll save twenty nine dollars a month. So I was like, uh, yeah. no. Thanks well, that for tells that. you how so, much those targeted ads are worth. If you if, yeah, if they're worth want. thirty bucks, it must be more really to AT and T. Yeah. That's amazing a month. Certainly. We're so, gonna so take a break. Come back with more. I, I, We've got a great panel. Brian Brushwood is here. Also, Larry Maggot from CBS. And saferkids.org. And now I'm going to tell you about something I don't know anything about, ladies and gentlemen. Project tracking with Atlassian Jira. I saw the Godzilla movie last week. Does that help? Gojira. Jira is named after Godzilla. It is a tracker for teams who are building great products. It's more, we're not just talking like uh, a GitHub here. This is everything you need. Of course, it works with Git beautifully. But you can follow your code from all the way from... Uh, the very beginning in the planning document stage all the way to delivery in one system. And for people who are managing big teams and big projects, and, and you see that some of the some of the biggest companies in the world use Jira. 70% of the Fortune 100, 70 out of 100 use Jira. NASA uses Jira, and they'd have some of the biggest projects of all. 25,000 companies in total. It's flexible and simple enough for a five-person startup, powerful and reliable enough for a hundred thousand person enterprise, that is amazing. So can, this is this is Leo. Like I, I, I assume, and and I, I hope you can explain it to me. Like uh, basically, you you got a project, you got a few people working on it, and and similar to what uh, Google Docs innovated yeah. is that everybody touches it and it changes real time for yeah. everyone, right? Well, and better than that because there are already this is so widely used. There are thousands of Jira add-ons. You can do test management time tracking, project management. I mean, there's literally, you go in there and you'll, you'll just see all of the different ads-ons because this is so uh, popular. It works, as I said, with Git. Uh, it works with Google Docs if you want to use Google Docs. I want you to visit atlassian.com slash twit for more information on Jira. Very affordable. Plans start at $10 a month for up to 10 users. This is what Pied Piper should be using on Silicon Valley. They are using Leo, look, I, I'm sure it's. I'm sure this is amazing, but I'm not made of money, sir. I want to know if this is good before. <laughs> you're you're I jump hysterical. Into it. Try it free for 30 days. You don't need what? this, Brian. You don't need it. I don't need it. And half the audience is leaving. Thank you for joining us. Every time I talk about this, they're <laughs> Atlassian Jira. Die, so so dive in, dive in for 30 days free. Free. You know, look, you know what. If you're a potential customer for this, you know what it is. You know what you would do with it. You've probably already looked at it. And I'm just encouraging you to give it a try because there is really no better way to do this. It's Atlassian's J-A, J-I-R-A. And there are plenty of people in the chat room who know what it is, and I have no clue. What did you, you, this Microsoft has its own tools for this kind of stuff, right, Ben? I mean, they don't. Uh, yeah, no, Microsoft. Uh, they do everything uh, in-house. Yeah, they, they do. Um, yeah. Some of them are best in breed. Some of them are not. But <laughs> yes, we, we they, won't they name names. Yeah. Well, that's the way you should do it. Uh, boy, there's so many stories. I don't know where. Let, well, let's start it with the, the Beats Apple merger. Mm. <laughs> alleged. <laughs> it's alleged. Alleged. I, I am. OK, what? How many weeks now? Was it two I'm weeks ago? It. I said this is a bogus rumor mm. last week. Uh, I repeated it's a bogus rumor. TechCrunch is saying, hey, 70% chance this is going to happen. 
That sounds like science. Yeah. 70, well, uh, absolutely. It's not 68. It's not 72. It's 70 percent chance that wow uh now we're hearing starting to see uh cracks in the facade some are saying that tim cook was very upset about dr dre's video <laughs> that he posted on facebook and pulled down whoa whoa, whoa 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 what did i miss what did he say you didn't know this no dude mm -hmm. i missed all this stuff i'm not very oh, savvy on this kind of thing rumored to say uh, no, 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 because you can see somebody skimmed it and it's on YouTube. I can't play no, no, it. No, I meant Tim Cook is rumored. Oh, yeah, well, no, no one no, knows no, what's... No one knows. Yeah, I think the whole thing never was it was it was going to happen to begin with. Uh, Walter Isaacson I mean, I, 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 said, I the guy who wrote Steve... I don't know why they Steve, wouldn't. I mean, why I mean, would Beats, they? Well, because Beats is an extraordinarily powerful brand. Like, um, uh, there was sort a... Uh, well, so, is, so is Betty Crocker, but that doesn't mean you <laughs> buy it. <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know if it's if it's there and you're sitting on a mountain of cash like Apple. Why not? You I could mean, afford yeah, to buy the entire music industry. Do you really want Dr. Dre at your board meetings? Uh, from you, a, you want from his a... brand? I mean, here's the thing. Look at it this way. You're telling me that if you asked any five people on the street what beats are, you're telling me that not one of them would know what it is. No, I everybody mean, knows what beats is. Exactly. That's the point. It's like you buy that brand. But, but Apple's not but, in that business. That's a headphone business. Apple, everybody knows what Apple is. Apple doesn't need, you know, brand recognition. They already have it. It's yeah, they're the Apple. number one brand in the world in many yeah. cases. Yeah. Well, I mean, the question is, you know, the music service, the streaming service is good. You know, actually, the funny part about the streaming service is my original action re attitude was, you know, I respect Dr. Dre, but it's not my kind of music, so I kind of stayed away from it. And then when the story broke, I actually checked out the service, and it's actually a very good streaming service. It's based on Mog, even, which I was a, a yeah. big fan of. Right, but even of those of us I who don't Mog. particularly like yeah. Dr. Dre's music, it's still a good service. And I don't no, know it's not a hip hop. Needs that. It's not streaming no, it's hip hop. It's every it's 20 no, million it's songs, just like everything yeah. else. Its only yeah. flaw is that it came after everything else, so it's right. last to the market, and it has not received a lot of adoption i've i told this story before you know at&t was offering a family deal 16 bucks for everybody to have unlimited access to music mm -hmm. that's a considerable savings off the 10 bucks per person i was paying i went to my kids and they said no way we like spotify we're happy with pandora we don't want to no so there was yeah, a non-starter because they'd already are... established their you know they'd set it well, up I, th so, I, th I suspect you guys Apple's are playing the wrong game. First of all, you're 100% right. Everything all of you guys ha said is 100% is right because Beats is late. They just bought Mog or whatever in the streaming game. However, if you ask people on the streets, they don't say any of that stuff. They don't talk about Beats streaming music service. They talk, they no, talk they about one thing. They, they, say, they, say, they say exquisite presentation of music. That is the brand of Beats. And in that regard... Apple would be smart to pay a billion dollars. Te or $3 tech Crunch, dollars Tech Crunch, further digging a hole. John Biggs saying, "Oh, it turns out it's an acquire. You know where you hire somebody by buying their company." Uh, this is three days ago. Apple Beats deal is happening, and it's a Dr. Dre acquire. Three point two billion dollars to get Dr. Oh. Dre in the executive suite, and maybe J Jimmy Iovine, who is a very well connected music. And Ben, you. What, what do you think? A, was there ever an Apple Beats deal? B, is it going to happen? C, why? Uh, a, yes, there was, uh, as far as I know. Um, B, I think it likely will still happen. Interesting. Um, and C, uh, there is a very compelling case to be made for this deal. And I think the case we made against it is is a little more subtle and different than I think most critics are making. So uh, um, you agree with uh, Brian? It's about the brand? Yeah, well, I think Beats brings three very compelling things to the table for Apple that fixes, um, you know, th three challenges for Apple. Um, one is the, you know, from a business model perspective, the headphones are a lot like Apple products. They're taking a quote-unquote hardware commodity and they are selling at a significant premium based on kind of the what they are, the experience of owning them, the, the brand on the side. And that's not to, I'm not at all mean to cheapen what an Apple product is, but uh, the, well, first of all, you reason exactly an described an Apple margin. product. <laughs> what you said is 100% correct. Keep well, going. The, the difference, Isn't the, difference the Beats is that... brand a little beat up, though? I mean, they've been sold and bought and sold and bought. HTC bought them, it, Lenovo. I mean, they, no, it, we're, we're, we're looking at it as a bunch of, you know, 30, 40, um, 50 year olds. And, and the problem is that's the second thing they bring. Is, <laughs> You're not there no, yet. For, for us. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I, 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 I Who's whom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, for us, Apple is the epitome of cool. 
Um, but times change, and I think yeah. uh, for people who are in their teens or or or, or, or lower twenties, um, Beats is very much that that sort of brand. It's the brand that you aspire to. It's the brand that you want as as a present. It. You know, if you look at any music video, go back to Apple's iPhone launch event. They had the iTunes Festival video. Every headphone in that video, there were no white cords in that video. Uh, they were all red for beats. And that's and you, I watch a lot of NBA. Every single time they watch a player coming into the stadium, he's wearing Beats headphones. That's every true. athlete, yeah. every entertainer, all no, you that NBA. that lowercase B you see everywhere. Yeah, partly yeah, because also... Beats has been willing to spend. A significant. First of all, they have huge profit margins. They've been willing to spend a lot of that money and investment money on marketing. They do. I don't know what their marketing budget is, but it's clearly huge. It's, Every music video not, has a product. Beats product placement in it. They no, here's, here's about they here's how much they do. They here's do the headphones. Choice. I mean, come on, headphones were invented in the what forties or before that. Uh, I mean, it, they're it, headphones. It doesn't matter. You're talking like, like a sixty-year-old again, Larry. Stop. I guess. It. Yep. Here's Cold how you can gauge Beats's success is that by the numbers, Beats is identical to Apple in that they do high margins, they do premium billion uh, dollar aesthetics. revenue a year. Uh, correct. Uh, they also are identical to Monster cables in that they they oh, yeah. don't Mon significantly used have to better make their hardware headphones. than anyone else. Yeah. But they are they are a premium brand. However, unlike Monster, which is increasingly growing a reputation of being you know laughably hilariously you know like uh, you know overpriced and stupid. Uh, Beats has dodged that. Beats has, has, in general, maintained their brand as being an exquisite commodity. And I think in that regard, that that, that brand is worth Apple investing in. I think Yinka Adagoki writing in Billboard says five things are holding up the deal. One, it's complicated. Uh, the biggest deal Apple's ever done. Tim Cook's very first big deal. Two, the leak didn't help. The news was leaked too early. Apple was nowhere near ready to have the deal. And it's true, Apple has not denied it. Nobody's come forward from Apple yeah. saying, no, we're not interested. Um, perhaps they were just very early in the negotiations. Three, the video. <laughs> uh, now, this is Billboard sources. They say this is our favorite bit of gossip from our sources. Apparently, the Apple family near imploded with outrage when the video went up on Facebook of an excited Dr. Dre with... Uh, Tyrese, in the video, they share in language unsuitable for a family program or blog how Dr. Dre will be hip-hop's first billionaire yeah, and other nice yeah. things about Compton. Uh, I'm just reading from the quote. I don't know what that means. Wow. <laughs> people often, people often uh, forget that despite Apple being this company that makes sexy products with sexy pro profit margins and sexy retail outlets, it's kind of conservative. And Tim Cook kind of conservative. And apparently this... The reason this video was pulled down so fast from Facebook, uh, we're only watching the skim of it uh, that somebody put up on YouTube. Apparently, Chief Keefe. Let me close his Man, thing. I, I, I don't know, Leo. That's that's hard for me to buy the idea that basically, you know, uh, Tim Cook's a stodgy white man who has a lot of money and therefore can't uh, approve well, of anyone. How about this, though? Where, where do you it. put Dr. Dre? Where do you put Jimmy Iovine? I mean... Uh, are you going to put them in charge of content? Is that or what? What do you do with them? Well, uh, that that I mean that is that is some two of the other reasons. I think one is uh, the, the fact is Apple. You talk about Spotify is behind in streaming. Well, if Spotify is behind, then what is Apple? Right. Um, they're not even in the in the game, and you know Apple is not averse to buying technology to get into something. And they bought iTunes for crying out loud. I mean, it's it's not a. Uh, and in that get, Apple has always owned music. Apple's been synonymous I, with I, music, and they're no longer the preeminent. I understand, brand but I think Tim Cook has to swallow some real, has to really think hard. For instance, you know, Dr. Dre has been has said some pretty misogynistic, homophobic mm -hmm. things in the past. Um, mm -hmm. I just find it hard to I mean, believe I mean, okay, that but, Apple would, but, no. would absorb I mean, this. For, First of all, I actually think legitimately that it would be worth a billion dollars for for them to make Dr. Dre a brand ambassador for Apple. I think that would be worth Apple. Apple is in a late place environment for their their music streaming service. If you can get a yeah. top tier, Apple's even top farther line, behind than Beats is. Wow. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And so and so they're they're buying a first place ambassador for them. I think it might be worth a billion dollars. I don't know. Yeah, I, I not actually, a billion. Three point two billion. How do you feel now, Brian? Uh, it was still worth it. Still worth it. Uh, in fact, uh, I was trying to say earlier, Scott Johnson asked, like, how on earth 
does Beats go for $3 billion and Twitch go for only $1 billion? And the answer is, quite simply, for the brand value. Everybody knows who Beats is. Nobody knows who Twitch.tv is. Everybody, well, who, can, everybody who matters knows who Twitch.tv is. Well, Are you Beats kidding? Did 1. This is a huge... Beats billion in revenue last year. Yeah, I mean, Beats that's... made money, and that's... Well, I don't... I don't know how much money, but given that their profits are probably pretty high. Twitch.tv, I'm going to say maybe one in 20 people on the street knows what that doesn't is. It doesn't matter. It's I'm a YouTube acquisition that knows. YouTube people know. That what's number one on YouTube is game videos. This is the smartest thing YouTube could do. Well, sure. Uh, yes. And you're 100% right. That has been the greatest innovation in the last 10 years yeah. is, is Machinima discovering yeah. that people love watching other people play video games. And, YouTube's uh, been desperate to find an alternate to, hey, those, to the crotch us, shot, and they found it. We, we, we learned that with <laughs> Nintendo and the Crotch shots out. Uh, 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 I don't know. Master Chief crotch shot is in. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the, I, I, I personally find the whole Dre angle, um, to me, that's the more far-fetched one. I, I don't see, I don't see, I see the Jimmy Ivey being, uh, coming on board i i have trouble seeing the, the dre angle but just what I, I think the whole video thing is kind of overdone i mean honestly if the video if that celebration video was enough for apple to that's not to it. scuttle no. the deal well no. i mean it's actually way more concerning than anything because that means apple had no idea what they were buying right i mean anyone who's familiar with <laughs> you, you buy dr dre you're gonna get some videos yeah well i mean well it's not just that it's that it's that though if the whole point is to get into the beats brand and the way mm -hmm. it reaches a new generation that's why it reaches um, them that's very mild by hip-hop right. standards i mean it, it, it right. i mean it's hip-hop is is i'm not i'm no hip-hop expert at all um but it's very much a very honest genre that like you the whole point is to hold nothing back um talk very clearly about you know your feelings and right. uh, i mean I, i'm i'm totally generalizing I, i'm not a hip-hop expert at all but the whole point being like if they didn't know it then that that's the way things would might go down then that's that's concerning from an apple perspective right. and i doubt the video i think it was more the week like the in the financial times the wall street journal that, that it was very specific um from what i've heard it came from the beat side and that's something that Apple, we know very well, is does not enjoy. That's all. true. I don't know. Look, Ben keeps saying he's not a hip hop expert. I'm, I'm pretty sure that the only way to tell for sure is for us to drop a beat and for us to hear <laughs> him freestyle for a little bit. That's I the want only a little freestyling. We'll when we sure. come back, Ben uh, Thompson will freestyle his. <laughs> <laughs> this chair will be mysteriously empty. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, our show today. You wanted to know what Harry's was. I will tell yeah, you. No, I will you, tell you. You, you have talking up Harry's. All right, Harry's. walk me through this. What do we got here? Harry's. So the guy, one of the guys, Jeff, who started Warby Parker, um, it started this, uh, Harry's about a year ago, something like that. Andy and Jeff started it. They realized that there really is, you know, if you go to the store and you and you look at the the Fusion Razor system, you know, you get the you get the handle, sure. you get three blades, you're now out 40 bucks. And then, I don't know what we're talking, five, six bucks a blade from then on. Uh, there's these are terrible prices. In fact, the razors are so expensive that they nowadays you can't buy them off the shelf. You have to get a clerk to unlock <laughs> the protection system. Yeah. It's true. That's actually it's true. Crazy. I know. So they said, you know, I think Where, there's an opportunity. Yet, Leo, I, I mean, I don't want to start rumors, but I'm I heard somewhere, and this may not be true, but I heard that the blades of everyone else are made from the bones of children in Africa. I, I don't know. You if know, that's they call them blood razors, and I don't. <laughs> I don't reckon no. So Harry's they make their blades. By the way, they have their own factory in Germany. So they're I mean, these are really good high, you know, German steel, German blades, the best in the world for strength and sharpness. I'm showing you this is the uh this is the Winston kit. They have a Truman kit and they have a Winston kit. Uh the and then you, I'm ordering one right now. What's the difference? Uh the the Winston kit has the metal and you can get it engraved. This is a metal handle oh, and you can get yeah. it engraved. It's twenty five dollars if you want the engraving. I think that costs a few bucks more. The Truman is a little less expensive. It has a plastic blade. You know, it's funny. Some people prefer fat not blade, plastic handle. Some people prefer the Truman because uh the uh handle is you know, it's funny. We uh, we sent the uh, Winston to Steve Gibson and he ended up going back and ordering a Truman because he wanted the handle was uh, flatter. There was a different feel to it. But I'm 15, ordering one right this minute. Yeah, get the Truman. The $15, you kidding? get the handle, three blades, a tube of shave cream. So it's a month of shaving for 15 bucks, And then you can get, uh, I mean, uh, you can get uh, replacement blades. 
the design is really well done. You know, it's a lot of these very hard to eject the blades. This just pops right off very easily, uh, but it but it's a sure uh, attachment. It's the best shave you ever had, and it comes yep. with something that will actually transform your shave. It's more than just the blade. It's the Harry's Shave Cream, which is quite remarkable. Um, it is I'll not a not a lot not a you know aerosol can. It comes in a tube. It's good for the environment. Smells fabulous, and it will give you the smoothest, cleanest shave you ever had. If, if, I told Leo. If you've never, the reason, if you've never the reason I'm actually it. ordering one and paying for it is that even though you sent Steve Gibson a free one, is that <laughs> I can afford $15. I want you to send me that $327 heel microphone. Yeah, we'll send you the microphone and you buy yeah, the razor. Okay? I'll buy the razor. Hey, I'm not dumb. <laughs> this is so smooth. I don't even I don't even need the cream. The cream smells I'll tell you what, really I'll, good. I'll say universally, man, if you've never spoiled yourself on a razor, just it's go worth for it. it. It's so great. Get a good it's, razor. Yeah, you know, can I tell? I don't. I don't know if I've told you this secret here, Leo. Uh, I have not shaved my face. I think I've shaved my face once in the last ten years. I shave only my neck, but every time I shave it with a crappy. Wait a minute, that's a razor, ten years growth beard. I mean, I use I use a beard trimmer. Oh, okay, to trim all right. Down to like, I I got this permanent scruff thing, but it's like. Um, uh, oh, I think oh, there are a lot of guys with like you that. Gave up on shaving because it was such an unpleasant experience. I'll tell you what, man. When I use a crappy old razor, it's like I got razor bumps. I got stupid bloody and scabs. Then, can I just you tell you? You know what you, ladies don't love, Leo? What Turns don't? out scabs, scabs on your neck. Not number one scabs with on the ladies? not very popular. No. Can I just tell you, I know there's so many people who buy plastic <laughs> disposable razors and <laughs> shave with them. <laughs> what is kidding? wrong with you? Oh, there are. What are, is wrong horrible. with you? Do They're not. Cheap. Do that. They're cheap. They're cheap. And yeah. you get what you pay for. Oh, By the way, and it, yeah. the cream, natural ingredients, licorice, cucumber, mm. that soothes your skin, moistens your skin with marula and coconut oils, and then refreshes you afterwards with eucalyptus and peppermint. And if you're hungry. It's delicious. Right? Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yes, if you're hungry, you'll, you'll be even hungrier after yeah. you shave with Harry. So here's our deal. <laughs> Visit harrys.com, get the set, it'll be delivered right to your door, and if you use the promo code TWIT5, T-W-I-T and the number 5, you'll get $5 off your first Hey, I just bought one, and you didn't tell me that. <laughs> you, you <laughs> I just spent 15 bucks. I could have saved you 5 bucks. I'm Don't sorry. be like Larry, people, oh, come on. I'll tell you what, Larry, we'll throw in a pop screen for your brand new microphone. All right, TWIT5, okay. But All right, so the next ad, just a tip, don't buy till you hear the whole ad and you get the offer code. No kidding. <laughs> Just a tip. Really? Mm. That is delicious, that Harry's cream. Uh, okay, I'm mad at Amazon, and apparently I'm not the only one. Everybody seems to be a little bit upset. We all thought that Amazon was going to change shopping, going to change the experience of book buying. Yeah, they were great until they got a monopoly. Now they're just screwing with everybody. Uh, Matthew Ingram writes a great compact. We should get Matthew on to talk about this. Giants behaving badly. This is in GigaOM. Google, Facebook, and Amazon show us the downside of monopolies and black box algorithms. The latest on Amazon is this Hachette thing. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know anything about this. Walk me through this. You don't know anything about anything, Brian. You've admitted <laughs> that now with every story. Well, I mean, this is what happens, Leo. When what do you, you call do? Me five you just do magic all day. You don't. <laughs> you don't read the tech news. <laughs> But he's entertaining. I, I represent the everyman. That's what I do, Leo, and I do that very well. I represent no, he, their ignorance. You should run for president. It worked well for Reagan and Bush. <laughs> <laughs> so this comes from uh, the uh, New York Times. As publishers fight Amazon, books vanish. The story began with Hachette, which is one of the big five, a French publisher, but they have Little Brown and a lot of other imprints. They're a very, very big publisher. And a we don't know exactly why Hachette got on Amazon's uh, bad side, but of course you could speculate it might have something to do with Amazon the demanding. List. Yeah, they got on their Hachette list. The Amazon demanding maybe a Ben. That's good. Ben, that's good. You might want to make that the headline High on five, your next blog. Leo, that yeah. was a good one. That's good. <laughs> no, that's, that's Ben. Ben came up with that, the Hachette okay. list. Um, maybe they were trying to get a better deal from uh, Hachette on the cost of the books, et cetera. What happened first was that a lot of Hachette titles, including Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, Outliers, all of his books, were suddenly two to three weeks delayed. You couldn't order, even though you could go to a bookstore today and get them, uh, you could go to a third party seller and get them. Hachette said, no, we sent them boxes of them. They got tons of them. Amazon saying, no, it's going to be delayed. Now they're cracking down. It's even worse. This is Brad Stone's book, which I highly recommend, The Everything Store. 
Jeff Bezos and the Age of Amazon currently unavailable. What? You cannot buy it. other reason for that. You can, Amazon did not like this book at all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, you cannot buy it on Amazon. Uh, this is, but you can get a Kindle really edition, tough. though. Yeah, isn't that I mean, weird? I mean, first of all, like, I'm really conflicted as far as Amazon. I actually deeply adore once I became an Me Amazon too. Prime member, right? Like, we love the ability to to click a thing and have it be there the next day and so on. And, and of course, right. you know, weird promises of robot drones bringing us our stuff is very appealing. However... Uh, you know, their, their, their business, uh, along with I efficiency, comes all of the baggage that we associate with Walmart, right? Like, like we, we all hate Walmart for whatever reason. Uh, like, for example, my- We're not my talking efficiency reason. here, though. We're talking Amazon really acting in, in a way that, that violates the Antitrust Act. Look at this. This is, uh, it looks like you may never have heard of Robert Galbraith, uh, his new novel, The Silkworm, a Cormoran strike novel. This is J.K. Rowling. This is her pseudonym. Yeah. This yeah, book right. is out or about to come out. I'm not sure. It's not available on Amazon. Currently right. unavailable on Amazon. The Girls of August, a big Ann Rivers uh, Sidden uh, bestseller. Can you order it on Amazon? Unavailable on Amazon. So well, well, the question, what's the question is some like, people are speculating, you know, that, that Amazon... I love Amazon too. I'm a Prime member. I get stuff all the time. But but it has had a pretty negative impact on local booksellers, and it essentially owns the online book selling market. I mean, is this an example that they're flexing their muscles, and that they are an evil company, and that they're going to have a negative impact on our freedom to read? That's the big fear, right? That that, that some people expressed at the very beginning when Amazon became literally the Amazon of of, of the book industry. And, and there are those who think that this is, you know, proof of the pudding, that, that they are, in fact, uh, using their power to, to control what we read. So I mean, I, don't, Larry, I think it's more of a business issue, but it's a scary well, thought. I, I, I mean, is, is, that, is that the claim, Larry, that they're, uh, that they're actually trying to, to screw over, like, by not making certain things available? They're trying to screw well, over local booksellers? Like, what's their angle on this? I don't understand well, why they would stand against no, this. No, this doesn't screw over local books, but the point is that there are so many local bookstores that are gone out of business. Yeah, they already screwed them yeah. over, Brian. They, they, they put them out of business. <laughs> right. Now they but, have monopoly power, and now they're screwing publishers, authors, and ultimately readers by yeah. wielding that monopoly power. You know, in The New Yorker in February, there was an article that said Amazon is bad for books. And I poo-pooed it. I think I poo-pooed it on this show. Yeah, I said, me too, yeah. You know, come on. Amazon's great. I mean, yes, admittedly, we're losing our bookstores. But Amazon sells books and they're, they're, they love books. And, uh, boy, I think George Packer was right. Uh, I think it didn't so, take too long for us to well, I think, realize. I think this is, this is the... This is the problem that you're getting at. I mean, leaving aside whether it's antitrust or not, I'm not an antitrust lawyer. Um, you know, I, I, uh, the big issue is Amazon kind of got the benefit of the doubt with a lot of this stuff because they so relentlessly frame themselves as doing what's best for, for right. the customer. Customer and focused. So, and so even when it came to these book disputes previously, like there was one with Macmillan, uh, I think it was Macmillan uh, four or five years ago where they pulled similar tactics. Yep they could say we're doing it because we want to make sure there's the lowest price. And and so even if you disliked what they were doing to the market, you could say, well, it is true. They've been consistently trying to have the lowest prices. I can see their angle that being good for the consumer. The problem is now uh, it's by making books unavailable uh, and doing it on purpose. Like this is Amazon's choosing to do it. They are proving that the consumer actually isn't their top priority. Because if it was their top priority, they would keep the books available while negotiating in the background. And that's the bigger danger for Amazon. Beyond any sort of legal remedy that may or may not arise, whether or not they violated anything, it's, I think, not just you know, for a lot of people, it's kind of lifting the veil that Amazon had very successfully put in place that, yeah, we, we may do stuff that you find a little uncomfortable. We may be killing local bookstores, blah, 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 but we're doing it because it's best for the consumer. Yeah. Well, now there's an example. They did something that wasn't best for the consumer. Like well, exactly you you right. use the word Walmart, Brian. It is a lot like Walmart. Well, th there's a fantastic book called The Walmart Effect where one of the examples they give is uh, previous to Walmart, every time you ever bought deodorant, it always came in a box. And uh, Walmart, one of the effects, you know, and again, there's all kinds of legitimate reasons to be upset with Walmart. But one of the things they figured out is like, wow, we're wasting, you know, 10 to 15 cents per package 
to have cardboard printed to put this uh, this in. This is stupid. So they worked with the uh, uh, with the deodorant matter manufacturers, and nowadays, purely because of Walmart, they they cut out. Uh, five to 15 cents per product out there. And and it didn't just happen for Walmart. It happened for all of the other ones. You you go to anywhere now, you can't find deodorant inside of a cardboard box anymore. And that's all because of Walmart. Uh, and and it's like, I understand, like, like there there is efficiency. What we all want is for content creators and for the people who make the products to get a bigger chunk of it and and to have a more efficient structure. But on the other hand, it's like, uh, man, it's it's uh, Amazon is not nice to people who own the content. Uh, my my fire eating book is thirty nine ninety nine is the retail price for it uh, because we didn't want to make the the cheapest book uh, to teach how to eat fire. But but Amazon, <laughs> you really don't want like, budget fire eaters. You're really looking it, for a, a higher exactly. class of fire. Like readers. like nobody says I want to learn to eat fire and I want to pay <laughs> as safe. little as humanly possible. <laughs> That's for right, it, right. <laughs> uh, and so and but but like meanwhile, like they they have these aggressive rates. I think I I think I make like fifteen fifty per book. Like like two thirds of the profit goes right. to Amazon for that stuff. So yeah, but it, it's, by it's, the way, if you had published with a regular publisher, you would have made a buck fifty a book. Right. <laughs> That's so true, in one respect, but in one respect, <laughs> okay. authors, if they, you know, do it the Amazon way are going to do better. That's a good point. I just don't That's like to point. see a company. And then, yeah, and it's great that deodorant doesn't come in boxes. But it, but what's scary is that a company has that kind of power and can wield it. And I think you nailed it, Ben. Amazon supposedly cared about customers more than anything else. And this yeah. this is a it little bit of a It reminds me of the whole deal between networks and cable companies. What was it? Time Warner uh, blocked CBS programming for a while because they were locked Very into much. a deal. And the consumers, you know, the, the, they're, the viewers are the ones that were hurt by that. And nobody expected until they cable finally companies their, their stuff out. to love us. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> that was no surprise. No, but, I, but Apple's done the same thing. When, 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 there was, uh, when a publisher published a negative, or actually wasn't even a negative book, but a book that's an unauthorized uh, yeah. biography yeah. of Steve Jobs, you remember this, Steve pulled that publisher's yeah. books from the Apple Store. He said, well, well we're just not going to sell your books. But the right. Apple Store did not dominate the book-selling marketplace. Amazon does. Right. And uh, this is a little scary. So part two of uh, Matthew's excellent uh, column talks about uh, Matt Howey and Metafilter. Uh, Metafilter, which is a site some of you remember from the earliest days of the Internet, um, a great link site. It's still around, metafilter.com. But something has happened to Metafilter, and their Google ranking has just tumbled, and it's cost them 40% of their ad revenue. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. And his point, uh, Matt Howey's point, and he writes this in the Medium, uh, is that you know we could be out of business because of something that happened at Google that we don't know about, understand. Perhaps Google feels like the links on Metafilter, because that's what it is, is a link. Uh, a link collection, just like all blogs were originally. Maybe yeah. they feel like these are not legitimate links or whatever. He says 90% of our revenue comes from Google AdSense. That's how, you know, we do take subscriptions, but very few people pay money for it. Um, over the th last 13 years, Metafilter is 13 years old. Traffic has grown steadily over our sites, as has revenue. It's allowed us to get our increase our staff to eight people with full health, dental, eye care, a 401k, um, you know, sane hours. He's laying people off. And he says, and I don't know why Metafilter has lost 40% of its traffic. Ask Metafilter has lost 40% of its traffic overnight. Um, All right, look, I'm, I'm going to say something that might not be popular, but it's like... Uh, look at the Google's graph before you say anything. Okay, I'll, I will look at the graph. Look at the graph, because the graph is kind of telling. It's sudden. Sure. Sure, but you know yeah. what? This is what it means when you build your business on another business. Oh, he even the says that. He says, live the by the Google, die by the Google. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, but, you know, this is a case. Sucks. I'm not it's, saying it's, it's cool. It's very, very similar to the Amazon case where we have given a company, Google, all power. If you are not listed on Google, if you don't show up number one in the search, you don't exist. You, of course, you still have your website. But but no one can find you, and I, I don't care if you're on Bing. <laughs> right. No, it happened to me actually. My my safekids.com site took some ads that Google didn't like. I kind of made a mistake, and I I went to these text link ads for just a little while, 
And I went from number one and number two in the listings on online safety to becoming invisible. When I realized the mistake, I took the ads down and I eventually kind of crawled my way back up. I'm still not number one yet, but it, it, it's a very big mistake if you do something that pisses off Google. And uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, but, 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 you know, they have a huge amount of clout and you don't want it to happen. Well, whatever clout we have, I'm going to send people to metafilter.com. If you ever use metafilter, if you like yeah. metafilter, go there. Uh, Matt's trying to raise uh, the money to keep metafilter alive uh, because they're not going to make the money. Uh, yeah, well, the, the, the bigger problem is that he has no idea what, why he did it. I mean, you knew it was box. those ads. Right. Exactly. And, and that's, and, you know, metafilter is, Metafilter wasn't like uh, some of the, like the demand media stuff where they were Not at all. explicitly built on Google. Like they existed first, and they predate Google. Then, That's right, right. And then Google, you know, it, it, so it's, it's not like they chose to be propped up by Google. It's it that was the way things went. Yeah. And and I mean, I mean, whether or say, not well, they intended yeah, they, to they, do they, it, they, they worked to give horse in the mouth or something to that effect. But the problem is, is Google has this power. And no one know, and the problem is not knowing, not knowing why it happened, what right. the issue exactly. was. And and I, exactly. I think this is this is I think one of Matthew's broader points, and it's the same thing with Amazon, uh, and Facebook this week. I mean, there's that 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 the guy on Facebook complaining about the the, the quality of news. Um, like, I feel like a lot of these tech companies, and one of the great things about tech is the very idealistic way that people you know look at that they're, they're changing the world and and this sort of thing, and and. There's, I think, almost a, an ignorance about the power that they're wielding, and it's it's real, it's dangerous. I mean, it's it's messing with, uh, like people's livelihoods in this case, right. and I I feel like personally, just in general, I think Matthew's article is very good. Like, tech needs to get a lot more, some of these companies be a lot more serious about the power that they have, and if they don't get serious, uh, the seriousness will be put on them, like it was for Microsoft in the '90s, for example. Right. I love yeah, uh, I love uh, Mark Andreessen's uh, tweet on all this. He says, if we could only get monopolies to run as well as private companies subject to competition, everything would be great. We gain benefits from the monopolies that Google and Amazon wield. Absolutely. But we just got to get them to act as if they have a comp competition. But the problem is, the nature, the right. and I think this is the challenge, is the nature of so much technology, uh, like it naturally monopolizes, right? Yeah. I mean, if Google by virtue of being the largest search engine, all things being equal, is going to, to increase its lead over the second place search engine just because it has more searches. I mean, and that's the case in lots of these businesses where there's the network effect and returns to scale. Uh, like technology by its nature lends itself to monopoly. And so this is this is gonna be, this is not new, it's not, it's gonna keep happening, it's gonna keep getting worse the more industries that are affected by technology and um, and it's something that I think we as an industry need to start thinking a lot more deeply about. Brian is our uh, free market uh, libertarian. You have a you have a solution, Brian. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, that's a very courteous way of you saying let's listen to the crazy person's point of view. And the crazy <laughs> no, no, I don't point disagree view, with you. I am uh, no, no, I, I mean, am with you. I am with you. Like, I, I don't I don't like seeing anybody lose their job. But at the end of the day, if the net core value of Metafilter is to serve only as a middleman to hand people off from Google to the site that they go to. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know that the world is a better place for having that extra step in there, you know? And it's like, it's really up to, it's, it's, it's up to the world to decide, you know, I, hopefully what'll happen is that Metafilter has their own core audience. They have their own passionate fans who go to Metafilter as their alternative to Google and that they live and thrive and survive on their own. But, but again, it's like, if that's not the case, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to tell you. And you, you can know? make a very strong case that the world is a much better place because of the existence of Google. I mean, uh, yeah. the, Google's changed the world. The fact that you can, yeah. uh, we, we, we are so uh, inured to the advances that we live with that we don't really even feel them. But think about this. I can go to Google.com, enter in a fairly complex search term, and literally within a second get definitive answers to almost any questions – and it doesn't take it five seconds or 30 seconds or a minute. It's within a second. That's what's beautiful, Leo, is that no matter what your question is, 
you could find out that you have cancer immediately thanks to Google. <laughs> well, you know, no, it, 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 one of the, it, it fundamentally changed the way we acquire information. It's amazing. It, 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 I mean, on a level that, that it, it, it's beyond profound. I mean, I think about, uh, you know. I just typed in how high ago. is the Empire State Building. Yeah. In less time than it took me to type the answer, the question, it yeah. gave me the answer. It already knows. Way, you like, could have yeah, spoken yeah, yeah. it too now. It's 1,250 right. feet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in fact, now that's one nice feature. All uh, Chrome uh, operating Chrome, yeah. systems, if you're on a Google tab, you can you just say, okay, Google, how tall is the Empire State Building? But it, it will, will still you. give you the answer faster than it took to say that. You know what's fascinating, Leo, is to see the next generation, uh, their whole attitudes about what they expect out of technology uh, is changed. For example, my daughter, she's 10 years old. She has no expectation right. of ever finishing any question she ever writes into Google. <laughs> she types the first few letters, and then she looks at the autocompletes and then clicks on it. Well, that's interesting. Because she just knows it'll be in there. If I type it how have to spell it right either. tall, look at that. All I have to do is do how, and the very f next thing is how tall is the Empire State Building. Exactly, it, right? I, I don't even have to finish the type. Wow. Oh, that's that's amazing. That is mind-boggling, and we're well, so that's... used to it. That is mind-boggling. It's that, wonderful, I mean, I, man. We're, we're, I don't think this is a – I don't think, like, anyone's making a controversial statement here. I mean, that that's the point is – is Amazon has done great things as well. And if it were, yeah. you know, pure evil, then it'd be a lot easier to take a a position on these sort of things. And and I and that's the point is like, you know, Google has done great things. And that's that's the meta filter issue. You say, oh, meta filter should have never, you know, um, taken advantage of the Google track that they got organically. Like they've never been one of those like SEO like scammer sort of things like they just started getting more google traffic because they had good content and google because it's a good search engine linked to them like and so you're you're almost arguing against yourself brian and saying that like oh they shouldn't have google's so good but they should have like ignored all that traffic by google being a doing a good job like the problem is, is google started funneling them all this traffic because they were a good site and google was doing its job and then suddenly Google changed its mind, basically. Um, and and the problem is, like like any smart business owner, they they and they had to scale with it, right? The, the whole thing with MetaFilter is it's all moderated, right? Like there's I mean, not that much but, crap but, but up at, there. But at the end of the day, MetaFilter is competing against Google, and Meta no, and no, Google it's... has no responsibility to uh, MetaFilter is a place where people go to learn things, right? And uh, they derived a tremendous benefit from Google sending them a lot of links or whatever. And then, uh, and then a support, like for example, Reddit, I love Reddit. It's, it's great to get on there, but at the end of the day, uh, when I type in, I want to find a thing. Do I want you to point me to the Reddit article of today? I learned that this thing is a thing. No, I want to go to the thing. That's a, that, 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 that makes no sense. Google is not generating. <laughs> I'm good at Google's that. Google's not I generating that the answers. <laughs> no, I mean, the, the point is without sites like there Metafilter, has to be a Google place to go. No that's answers. right. There has to be, it's not the answer from Google. You're right. It's, it's, it's a index. That's all. Well, and speaking but, but, of great again, things, like, Google right. just did this photo stories thing on the Google plus again, it's like, you're giving me all this free stuff at this point. I'm starting to feel like, what are they up to? What is their <laughs> sneaky plan? Have you seen the photo stories thing? It's amazing. Uh, so, uh, do you know Leo, what? Breaking news. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't seen anything. Go ahead and walk <laughs> me through this. <laughs> actually, no. Actually, MetaFilter, MetaFilter should be happy because they're they're the uh, they're getting what the European Commission wants, which is the right to be forgotten. Yeah. There you or go. The, whether you want to or you not. You wanted the right to be forgotten. You wanted it. You asked for it. Here it you is. Got it. There it is. Yep. So, I do you ever put stuff on Google Plus, uh, Brian, or put photo? Do you have your phone uploading photos to? Uh, Google? Uh, you know, I, I I disabled that because uh, well, so I you're not getting the benefit of letting the Google Hive mind have access uh -huh. to all of your most deepest personal thoughts and images. By which you mean I haven't been seduced by the beast? No, <laughs> sir, I have not. No, it, it takes this conversation full circle. I mean, we, if you go back to Microsoft and the Surface, you could argue in Windows 8, you could arguably say the problem with it is they were doing it because Microsoft needed it, not because consumers ah, needed it. Ah. And I mean, it's a very similar thing with Google Plus. I mean, I think Google Plus in general, I think is much more about identity. Um, now everyone's logged in when they use Google, whether they realize it or not. And to that, I think it's a success. But the actual like Google Plus service itself, um, Google needs it to exist, so it exists. Um, I'm not, you know, that the reason why none of us were immediately familiar with what you're talking about is because none of Nobody us uses Google it. Plus. Yeah. <laughs> mm. 
So look, it takes your pictures. I for some reason I can't get into mine. And it turns you into Chad Johnson. It turns you in it makes a photo album with maps and little captions and stuff for of different things you've done. So this is Chad, this is Chad's trip home or somewhere. And to uh, Boston. To ba Boston. To Boston. And it just does it automatically. Oh, there he met yeah. Jesus. I met Jesus the gamer. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's weird. Um, it just does. It, it's gone through all of my photos since 2007, and turned yeah, them that's into the all. Probably, it, it goes into all of your photos, including the ones that you don't want to share. <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. And and so sometimes. But you're I'll not take, sharing like, them. It's just uh, only I can see this cute album. Okay. Well, this is this is actually where the money's at. I think there are two big things that people that are going to explode. Number one. Uh, we all have a ton of photos, and a lot of them are high quality. And they're a pain to figure out where they are and what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I, I cannot tell you. Like, I spent, I wasted like an hour looking for one photo that I vaguely remembered. Uh, a friend of mine was was talking about, like, September 11th merchandise or something. And I was like, oh, yeah, I took a photo of, like, after September 11th, there was this gift shop. Yeah. And they they had a sign that said all September 11th merchandise 50% off. Oh, and I thought God. that was offensive. Yes. And when was that again? And I, I wasted a stupid hour going through that stuff. Right. If we could get yeah. context awareness from our apps that do that. Uh, and, and the second thing also is also like a curation algorithm, something that can look at the composition of a photograph and say, I say three, I see three faces here. It does There's it. a lot of wasted it space over here. Yeah. Let's crop that. Let's make there, this It's happen. doing all sorts of super smart stuff. As Hammy2 in the chat room says, this is awesome and kind of scary at the same time. And that yep. kind of sums up this whole thing. I would just stop at awesome. <laughs> it's only awesome. It's a little scary. It's auto yeah. awesome. Our show today brought to you by Squarespace. Nothing scary about Squarespace. You know, during this is a company, caught it, talk about customer focus. During Hurricane Sandy, when the lights were out, the power was down at their New York servers, they hand carried gasoline upstairs to keep the generators going so that the servers wouldn't go down. This is a company that cares a lot about your website. And if you're hosted by Squarespace, you will never. Go down. They are unbelievable. We try to crash uh, Squarespace sites all the time. Inside.twit.tv, our blog, that's a Squarespace site. If all of you went there right now, and it's still hum along. That's because Double dog dare you, man. Go. You, 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 do the, you, do, you used to do a great job with these ads on NSFW. You would build sites. You, I mean, it's really yeah, cool. Yeah, we would. We would. Well, because that's the whole thing, right? It's like you go to Squarespace.com, you're able to build. Uh, you try it for free for two weeks, right? Yeah. You just go to squarespace.com. You can try all the 25 templates. They're all beautiful, very modern templates. They do things like mobile responsive design, no matter what size images, no matter what size That's screen. The big one. Yeah, it's going to look great. Everything looks good. So many, this is not one of those cookie cutter site design uh, applications. This is tightly integrated into Squarespace. The Squarespace software, the Squarespace hosting, they go together to give you an incredible website, whether it's your business, your personal blog. If you're a photographer, your portfolio, or an artist, all the plan levels, even the $8 a month level, have e-commerce. That, that's a really fabulous deal. It means you can take uh, donations for a school fund drive or a nonprofit for $8 a month. And by the way, that includes a free domain name when you sign up for a year. They have great <coughs> apps. The Squarespace Metric app for iPhone and iPad will let you check your page views, unique visitors, social media follows. The blog app makes it easy to update. To even to moderate comments. Go there two weeks. Just click the Get Started button. You don't have to give them an offer code or a credit card or anything. Um, import your data from your existing blog. You said you worked at Automatic. They'll import your WordPress blog right in there. You can see what it looks like. You can get a sense of what it would look like to have a Squarespace uh, blog. And then immediately change the template with a click of the mouse. The content's completely separate. It is gorgeous. Start your two-week two trial free. You don't need a credit card. But when you decide to buy, and they've got some great prices, use our offer code TWIT. You'll get 10% off your new account. Squarespace. Like me and Harry. Dot com. Who are, yeah, you see, you didn't wait. You got to wait. I the didn't offer wait. code no, TWIT. Yep. <laughs> okay? Save the 10%. You'll be glad you did. Uh, we love Squarespace. We've known these guys for years. They won four Webby Awards this year for design. Um, they just, they're really fabulous. Well deserved, too. I mean, they're genuinely I agree. awesome people. You know who deserves? Okay, so there's the what? It, what it, I used to do this in my hometown paper. They would do uh, plaudits and uh, brickbats.
They would do. Sure. Uh, what, what, what they used to say, uh, I can't remember what the phrase was. You know, here's the so there's the plot. It that's a terrible plot and brick bats. That is not going to be the name of my new blog. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> plotted and brick bats. That'll be the title Actually, of this episode. That might not be bad. Plotted and brick bats. <laughs> no, it's I sound like an eighty year old man. <laughs> I should be wearing a top hat and a monocle with a big mustache. I've got plaudits and brickbats. <laughs> what are the cheers and jeers? There you go. That's more yeah, like there it. you go. Uh, uh, although, no, it's just beets and bouquets. And I want plaudits and brickbats, man. That's Roses the money and stands. onions. <laughs> so a little brickbat for eBay. eBay apparently at the beginning of the month learned that it had been majorly <laughs> hacked. Eh, they thought, maybe we did not tell anybody about this. About Wednesday of last week, I heard about this. Immediately went to my eBay account. No word, no warning. So I thought, well, I'm changing the password. Finally, now, if you go to eBay.com, you'll see important password update. Uh, they have a part of the problem is they have 145 million users, every one of whom <laughs> needs to change their password. They say they're going to send uh, they're going to send out uh, emails, but it's going to take a while to that many people. We don't so here's know what you do. how much uh, has been compromised. That's the big problem. Yeah. What what I recommend everybody does, and I talked to Steve Gibson about this, and he did you really? When you talk to Steve Gibson? Sure. Uh, well, we were in the hot tub together the other day. <laughs> oh, really? It was amazing. Uh, he said, "I'll give what you, you a prod in brick bat." <laughs> so, <laughs> is when it comes time to enter your password, just mash your keyboard a bunch, and then every time you log into that site, <laughs> just do say, the same. I mash. forgot my password. Right. And then have them send you an email, and then you click on the thing, time. and then you get in. I think that is not Steve Gibson's idea, but, but <laughs> thank you for thank you for blaming him for that inanity. I give you a brick bat, sir, for that. <laughs> Three brick no, bats. No plaudits for me, sir. <laughs> no, All right, sir. Fine. <laughs> no, sir. So um, I, you know, this is another case very much like Target, where the company is not really saying exactly what happened. Apparently, enough to uh, they enough concern that they want everybody to. Uh, change their passwords. eBay saying eh, people didn't get any financial information. Right. Uh, they did not uh, properly encrypt the passwords. Apparently, they were encrypted, but not in a way that was uh, effective. Um, so they were very much worried about this. They say it's a precautionary measure. Um, credit cards apparently not swiped, but name, date of birth, email address, physical address. Yes. <laughs> everything you need for identity theft. Right? <laughs> Every basically yeah. everything you need for yeah. identity theft. Right, exactly. Um now remember that the CEO and CTO of Target lost their jobs over this. I don't know what's going to happen at eBay. We also remember that eBay is owned by PayPal. I certainly yeah. hope this isn't a reflection on how I mean, PayPal. If eBay owns PayPal or PayPal owns eBay. I mean eBay eBay PayPal, owns, owns eBay, eBay owns, owns PayPal? PayPal? E That's right. Doesn't eBay own PayPal? Who yeah. knows who the hell owns anybody? Right, eBay no. own eBay's bigger, so I think they own right. PayPal. They own PayPal, absolutely, yeah. Apparently, this did not affect the PayPal security right. system, but gosh, Which is good. Ah, I hope not. Um, the uh, data will be, according to Vice President Chief Technical Officer McAfee, uh, Raj Samani. Inevitably, the data that was stolen will be sold online. You are at great risk if you use the same password on multiple sites. It's just bad all around. So I know in general that you, Leo, are uncomfortable with uh, with private corporations having, uh, you know, your biometric data. But does no, this... No, not really. I gave Google everything, right? With uh, I, mean, I mean, does this make you comfortable with the idea of, of, of thumbprints? Or what is the way to authenticate uh, that? that no. I mean, I mean, it's like... Because somebody could copy that, right? I mean, the real just... the real issue is that these companies are not are not adequately securing their yeah. servers. They're not storing the information. All this information should have been stored hash with a salted hash. Mm -hmm. None of it was. All they're just not doing a good job of securing stuff. Uh, and the problem is we don't even know, frankly. Uh, we don't even know how they're doing. We don't know what's been stolen. Um, you know. It's it, they're not very forthcoming with the information about this kind of stuff. They'd even delayed telling people that it happened. And there's essentially nothing we can do. I mean, yeah, you can change you your password, but you can't yeah. you can't clean up the mess afterwards. It's, right. I mean, the Target breach is particularly annoying. What did what did people do wrong? They used a credit card at Target. Yeah. 
I mean, hey, well, you should you, never have done nothing. that. That was a mistake. Well, right. <laughs> but but keep in mind also, and this is important, is is remember at the end of the day, like your liability for fraudulent credit card purposes is true. Yeah. purchases true. is zero. Is zero. But here's, you have I'll no give liability. You, but well, eBay's a little different. So for instance, say somebody gets my eBay account, goes in, says, Oh, I look at this. Uh, Leo's selling his uh, Mustang for uh twenty thousand dollars. Let's just change that to twenty cents. Uh they change it, then they go back and they buy it. Or yeah. something well, like that. I mean, there's also like Pay, PayPal, PayPal, I, I believe, like like people think of PayPal like a banking institution. They right. are not. They don't they don't no, obey not, by yeah. those rules. They do they can freeze whatever your money they want. They're like, they want. Ah, it's all fraudulent and they take yeah. all your money. Yeah. By the way, not every country has those protections. You know, the credit card protections we have in this country, that's well, really? not global. There are there are countries where you I, don't have those and protections. And I'm not sure that's um a good thing in the United States that we have this protection because it's let everybody just go, well, who cares? We're not gonna lose more than fifty bucks. Well, and, and we've we talked about this it. because right. you were talking about how the move now is to chip and pin technology. By the end of next year, credit chip and yeah. pin. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the problem the problem here is, um, first off, I, they were salted in hash. They're using eBay's proprietary technique. I think the problem is no one knows what that technique was. Um, so that's that's part I of it. I thought the, they were uh, just encrypted. but oh, So you're saying they no. were hashed? They they were, but but eBay's like it's it's our own proprietary one, and no one kind of no, knows what that right. might be. Right. Um, so that it, it's it's even more of a black box in many ways. But the, the bigger issue here is is there's no one, there's no one. Uh, one, it's an extremely hard problem. I think it's easy to sit here and say that everyone should do a better job. Um, the problem is is one, it's hard to secure a computer system sure. by definition. Two, uh, passwords are really hard for regular people to to manage effectively. Um, mm -hmm. But but the broader issue is no one's really properly incentivized to fix this. I mean, you, you're getting at that with the consumers for credit card are generally not liable. Um, for someone like eBay or any sort of retailer, uh, you know, I have this for my site. I mean, I have a membership program and I have, uh, you know, I can choose the level of verification I want to accept a, 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 a credit card payment. And it makes sense generally to choose a lower one because you don't want to make it easy counter problems. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that, that pervades everything. I mean, it's, and it's really, I think realistically, uh, the target one is interesting. I think it was actually really encouraging that the CEO lost his job because ideally that is providing a better incentive for other companies to do a better job with password security so you don't lose your job. Yeah. Uh, it, but I think that that realistically, that's it's, it's probably going to take something where there's just massive penalties associated with losing information because otherwise um, – it, it it's expensive. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of expertise, and it's an unforgiving job that g provides you zero benefit until like you can't prove a negative, right? You can't mm -hmm. say, "Oh, this program is paying for itself because we haven't been hacked." Right. Like, how do you how right. do you how do you measure that? And that will make, that's what makes it so hard to have companies realistically give it the resources it deserves. Mm -hmm. Once again, you are speaking too intelligently for somebody who's up early in the morning in Taipei. So stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I want. Well, I just hit that point general, of lucidity it, it, where so, you've been up so long, long, nothing but brilliance comes out of your mind. <laughs> it, it, it's so easy to 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 say things like that they ought to take security more seriously. But, I, you know, like. What does that um, mean? Yeah. Yeah. Everything was back to priorities and, and kind of incentives. And. In, until you kind of grok with those priorities and grok those incentives and why the parties are the way they are, um, it's just kind of a lot of, you know, a lot of hot air. I shouldn't say that as someone who also hosts a podcast because that's what we make our living on. That's what we live on. <laughs> that's why I'm going to give you a snack right now, Ben Thompson of Stratechery, a Santa Fe corn stick from my nature mm. box. This is a Yum. this is a treat. Now, wait a minute. before <laughs> Larry Maggot, before you order this nature box... Yeah, really. Stay tuned because I'm going to give you 50% off. Nature if Box I'd is coming to the show. I could have picked one up. I know. I if you were here, you could have some pray. Oh, this is so good. The okay. praline pumpkin seeds. Did the studio audience get some? Nope. Come on, Leo. They're all Share mine. it with the audience. Nope. Mm -mm. Oh. Ah, I love this. Everything bagel sticks. Now the thing about mm. the thing I like about Nature Box is these are there's no high fructose corn syrup. There's mm -hmm. no trans fats. There's uh, no artificial flavors. Nothing artificial at all. Uh, no, no artificial uh, colors. It is delicious. These are nutritionist designed treats. You can get them delivered to your door every month. 
They have three size boxes. It's great for a family, but great for business too. We get we get like a dozen nature boxes a week, I think, because people love them. And look at all the treats. Hundreds of delicious treats. You can, if you choose, see my mouth's watering now, narrow it down to savory, sweet, or spicy. Uh, you can also choose special dietary needs like ve vegan, soy-free, gluten-conscious, lactose, nut-free, uh, non-GMO. You all of them? I wouldn't work with it. I get the I think assortment. My stomach just growled. I would if you selected oh, all of those, if you selected a... all of them, what would happen? Yeah. Is there no. anything? Well, what I would suggest is get this first box. We're gonna get you fifty percent off your first box when you use the offer code TWIT at naturebox.com/twit. And what I would suggest is just, unless you have a specific allergy or something, get an, get an assortment. Because speaking of which, like mm. uh, you, you know, my daughter, two of my three daughters have food allergies, uh, and both to nuts. Perfect. And I just looked at their yep. FAQ, and it says here that. Uh, it says here, uh, in just a few weeks, you'll have the option of choosing the snacks that best fit your dietary needs, and then you can write them at support at naturebox.com, which I'll certainly be doing. Well, this is not so free. So is it true that 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 that, that uh, plantains are, are free of all those things, that, that vegan, vegetarian, soy people can all eat? This That's is, right. Plantains, actually, everybody way, gets all the plantains they not, want. They don't like hey, to be called soy people. They're, that's not the preferred nomenclature. <laughs> you soy people soy. should eat more plantains. But just <laughs> wait a minute. Right. Come back up because, Chad, you see right there about this snack, and it shows you in a very easy uh, uh, logos what uh, the ingredients are. It, this is a nut-free snack, for instance. This is savory, vegan, low-sodium. This is really nice. This really pays attention to the nutritional value of the snacks. We have loved them. They're all really delicious. And uh, Lisa is a big fan of the dried pineapples, which are also nut-free. Mm. Uh, and the best dried pi pineapples we've ever had, the dried fruit on here is the best we've ever had. It's amazing. It tastes better than hairy shave cream? Well, that's a tough choice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you wouldn't shave with everything bagel sticks. That's the difference. Um, anyway, I just want you to check it out. You will be very, very happy with your nature box. First one, half off. Naturebox.com slash twit. Use the offer code twit. Uh, we've been very... Oh, by the way, did you see that? They also donate uh, nature boxes and food to uh, food banks around the country. 150,000 meals have been donated to date by Nature Box. You know, you, you know what I love, Leo, is that that kind of thing is is so... And and forgive me for phrasing it this way. It's it's so not extraordinary to donate. It's, it's happening it's just now. Look at nowadays. Tom, you know, you know what I think I mean? started with Tom's shoes, right? Where they give oh, a man. pair of shoes for every pair you buy. Warby Parker does that with glasses, a pair of glasses yeah. for every. I think this is this is re, it encourages me about a corporate conscience that, and maybe they're doing it for PR. Who knows? But I feel like they're not. I feel like the corporate corporations are starting to really care and want to give Here, back. And I think this here's is the best idea. part, Leo, is even if they are doing Who it with selfish. Right. right. Exactly. At the end of the day, people are getting fed. How right. great is that? Mm. And I hope that they're feeding them everything bagel sticks because they're really. <laughs> I bet you that tastes better than the snacks that Delta gives out on, in, on the oh. airplane. Airplanes. <laughs> airplanes. Wake up and smell the nature box, please. Really? Uh, oh, that's brilliant. Why hand out those crappy snacks? Man, because they're oh. cheap. Wake up yeah. and smell the nature box. Mm. They're even in smells, first class if you're lucky enough to be upgraded. They're cheap. <laughs> we have a Plus kid in the audience who want to just come here and try a nature box. Just see. This is good. You, in fact, take, take the whole. Do you like everything bagel sticks, you think? What's your name? Ethan. Ethan. And where did your brothers and sisters go? They just left? No. Oh, there they are. Okay. They're, you guys are from uh, Perth, Australia. So they don't have Nature Box in Perth. So go ahead, eat them, and you don't have, and and you'll know why America is the best country in the world. <laughs> this is why we won the Cold War, suckers. <laughs> you know, actually, having just come back from France, where they actually have routinely, you get good food. You don't oh, have to go out of your way. I know. No, dude. You know what they have food. in France? They have pollution box. It's a terrible alternative <laughs> to nature box. They have the, uh, right, what is it? The Deluxe Royale or Royale Deluxe? <laughs> the Royale with cheese. Mm. <laughs> ah, delicious. You order, you order coffee and you actually get good coffee. You oh, don't have to amazing. go out of your way. It's amazing. Yeah. I know. love France. And, and I ain't talking it, about no paper so cup. I mean, you get a glass of In beer. a glass. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. You go to a coffee. You, 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 know, you know, if you stand up at the coffee bar 
you pay less for your coffee than if you sit down. If you, it, it's it's a it's euro for tax. a cup of coffee if you stand, but yeah. if you want to sit in a seat, it's two and a half euros. Whoa, that seat's expensive. They they're renting seats, but you sit Good, there all huh? day. Yeah. Good, huh? Yeah, the whole family mm, loves them. Smart nature bucks. Uh, with WWDC keynote coming up a week from Monday, June second. It will be ten a.m. Mm -hmm. Mark Gurman, who it just got out of junior high school, apparently. He's very young. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm reading this guy. We quote this guy all the time. He writes for 9to5Mac, has the best sources anywhere. He is brilliant. And I find out he's 20 years old. I just feel like I can not I, I, I can no it's longer. Scary. It's scary. I shouldn't be in this business. It's a young man's game. Oh, but see, and here's what's great, Leo, is, is soon it won't matter. You you can be a, a mumra, a decayed old husk, and it won't matter. You'll be a, a, a vibrant, youthful Hey, we want to welcome you to the Plottage and Brick Patch blog. <laughs> yeah, I'm 20 years old. Stop saying Plottage and Brick Patch. I <laughs> think you'll be fine. There's your problem right there. <laughs> Apple, uh, apparently, according to Mark Gurman, again, the youngest man with the best connections ever, says that he's, he says there will be uh, OS 10 10.10, which is very confusing. 10 10 10. Uh, there will be iOS 8 with new health book fitness tracking software, improved maps, new iPad features. We don't know what they are. Are you snoring? Yeah, I'm snoring. Go on. Keep going. There will be new hardware, probably new MacBooks, Retina MacBook Airs. Anybody? Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. That's I good. jump at that. Are you yeah. kidding me? There's no rumors of any iWatch coming well, out? Well, there are rumors, but I don't know. Uh, uh, do, do you think mm. there's going to be any surprise? I guess what? The, the two ways they could surprise us is if the rumors of a full resolution, large format iPhone turn out to be true. Some kind of curve, but they device. won't announce that. Uh, nice. next, they won't announce that in June. Okay, so so do you, do you think there's a chance at an iWatch or no? No, I think they're going to announce that. Not even announce that this year. I think it's a. What do you think the Retina product. screen would do to the battery life of a MacBook Air? I, mean, I think it, that's it, one of the reasons you might not see yeah. a MacBook Air with Retina yeah. because I mean, to me, that's a lot I of pixels. love the fact that I can go all the way across the Atlantic on one battery with a MacBook Air. Yeah, that, that thirteen hours on the thirteen inch. It, it really screen, changed my life, you know, because I go to conferences now. I used to go and I would immediately look for a seat next to an electrical outlet. I right. mean, that was like my, right. my biggest priority. Now I can go to a conference all day, take notes, go on Wi-Fi and not have to worry. And, it, and, it, and it's like, you know, it's an enabling technology. It's not just an upgrade. It's, it, it, it's a substantial improvement in my lifestyle when I, when I, when I have to go on battery. And, and it's rare that, that you get any technology that you can make that statement about. By the way, that's why I buy these by the dozen. These are fake electrical outlet stickers. And I just go around the airport yeah. and I uh, I put those on all of It's great. And then I wipe That way them. you get the real one, right? Everybody right. else goes after the fake right. one. Right. Yeah. It's so fun to see everybody flocking. <laughs> Five dollars so, so, and seventy-five so, cents for a set of four kids. And what if you say you, you this, twit code? Can I get the, <laughs> no, no twit code on that. <laughs> the, the, the MacBook Air is a curious situation to me because when it was originally launched, the MacBook Air was the highest, most premium yeah. laptop out there. Right? There was news stories right. about how they're so light and so Crazy. thin that they they're get thrown great. away because nobody realized. But then they position it. I mean, Apple positions the MacBook Air as their entry-level version of the mm -hmm. laptop right now. It so is. with that being the case, why wouldn't you ruin the battery life on it? Why? Why? I mean, it's like there's no, it's your entry-level throwaway, every college kid's going to get it computer. That seems like well, first of all, exactly the brand that you'd want to flush down the toilet. <laughs> the 13, my, my, my. MacBook Air, my 13-inch Air, I think cost me 1400 bucks. That's so, more expensive. The, the still, cheap one is 11-inch, and it only yeah, has, You can get, get one for eight ninety nine, but that's yeah. still twice the price of a comparable, you know, in terms of specs, and right. the, twice the price of a, of a Windows laptop. So it's still not cheap. It's just less expensive than the other Mac. I tell you one thing I know we will see, and that's a 4K display. Uh, the MacBook uh, Pro with Retina and the MacBook, I mean, the Mac Pro so both support 4K displays. Apple yeah. has updated OS 10 to support 4K displays. Apple doesn't it's sell a, a really 4K smart display. Move. They've got to have I, a 4K display. I, I, I think it's a really smart move. I think that, by and large, the entire nature of 4K uh, has been mismanaged from the very beginning. This is a whole technology where they're they're selling the, the displays when literally nobody could tell the difference between 1080p and 4K. When you go to the movie theater, you're not even seeing 4K at the movie theater. You're seeing 2K at the movie theater. Yeah, but that's because uh, you're 20 feet away from the screen. 
Co correct, correct. But but if you want to do it right, and this is what I think Apple will do very smartly, uh, sell 4K based on the real estate for the screen. Like, and, and I pointed this out before, I'm looking at uh, six monitors right now. I would much, much, Why? much, much rather have one very large monitor that had enough room right. to fit all of these individual things on. Oh, that's there. a good idea. That's an well, I mean, th that's trivial. I mean, I think you, you could buy a 4K display and do that now. I think I actually disagree. I think what Apple Apple will do the same thing does Retina, which is high DPI. Uh, yeah, yeah, making it you know no, super that's high dumb. DPI. I, oh, mm, wait a minute. I now disagree. I have a 4K display. I got one of the only the two that have 60 hertz refresh rate. There's an ASUS and there's a Sharp, which Apple sells. They're insanely expensive. They cost as much as the Mac Pro itself, uh, 2,500 bucks. But I, it, with 10.9.3, they have high DPI, so I run it at 1080p, and it's the crispest thing I ever saw. It's not real estate. It's just beautiful because of the uh, subpixel rendering. And then when I'm looking at an image or a video, then I get dot for dot, and it's the best of both worlds. you got to see it before you poo-poo uh, it, Brian. It's well, really I mean, awesome. I, I would just say that in general, what you do is you get a modest increase in fidelity and at a major, major price. And there if you is a ridiculous sell it, price do, premium. Yeah, no, I right. Agree. Whereas if you're well, selling real estate, you, you know, it's it's quadruple the real estate. It's four times larger than 1080p. Well, you can that do that. That seems like the most smarter way I to sell it. I could do that. At CES, at CES already, already, last year, Sony, Sony had a 1080p set right next to the 4K set, and I was standing. 10 feet from it, watching their program that was a custom design to show off their 4K. And I could barely tell the difference. I mean, it was, right. it was, it was a final improvement. Uh, it's nothing compared to the difference between standard definition and 1080p. And so if they're going to sell it to watch movies, then, then they've got to come, they've got to do something different. So, you know, I agree with you. Uh, as a computer screen, yeah, I can see it making sense. But as a yeah, way of watching a movie. At arm's now, length. If, yeah. You're sitting if, right if, here. If you are yeah, talking right. about content viewing uh, subjective experience, I heard some rumors. A friend of mine is uh, over at Warner Brothers, and he talked about the experience of seeing a uh, HDR display. This is a whole new movement because everything you see on every display, display you see, every time they release something on Blu-ray, they have to take, you know, our eyes see all the way to the brightness of the sun, all the way to the darkness of, you know, candlelight and so on. Uh, uh, but our displays have an extremely narrow high end and low end of, of brightness on there. And so he talked about displays that are being made that are intentionally crafted using different technologies so that they're so bright that you have to squint to look at them. When something, when the sun shows up, you, you're physically in pain. Great. Uh, and he, say, he says it's fundamentally different from any other display you've seen Why before. Why would I want that? Because because it feels like reality it burns, in a way that it burns. doesn't and that 4K doesn't, right? All right. So, there are parts so of reality. There's nothing there's nothing great about reality, you know, when it comes to losing your eyesight. I mean, there's well, certain okay. things that you know, technology can <laughs> improve on. But right. what like matters sun. is if you want to motivate consumers, the, you, you have eyesight? to be able to have your product look different from the other guy's product. I right? think though we've I, underscored I the, the problem Apple is gonna have a week from Monday is Almost anything announces short of an eye watch, people are just going to say, well, so what? That's why I was snoring. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, and Apple, Apple, Apple's been pretty successful with so what announcements um, for, <laughs> for, for a lot of years now. I think. Um, well, but doesn't well, at some point, don't you have to innovate? I guess they got the yeah, Mac 2007, Pro. Two thousand seven, they came I, out with the I, the iPhone. Yeah. I mean, the the reason why do people why do people love Apple products? It's usually I mean, I mean, love not not like not like go go Gaga. Oh, it's the new thing. Not write headlines about Apple. Why do people develop attachments to that? Because it just works. It's the refinement. Yeah. It's the it's the working all together, and yeah. that that is very much innovation. It's not headline writing innovation, but it's doing the quote unquote snooze fest year after year, but making it better and better. And I, I mean, I think we we as an industry, if you look at, I mean, if you look at tech in the very big picture, you could arguably say there's only been four innovations in the history of tech period. That being, you know, the mainframe, the PC, the internet, and and the and the smartphone. And everything inside of that has been has been a snooze fest. I mean, it all depends on your context. I think we get so enamored with the headlines. Uh, and, you know, it was just human nature. We don't, we don't I'm know what we're doing day by day. Yeah, I'm going to back Ben up here and say that, uh, that, that none of Apple's home runs have been uh, daring innovations. They've all been extraordinarily safe bets that uh, yeah. that everything around them, you know, it's like the, the the time they take risks is when you get something like a Newton 
You know, it's 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 <laughs> only after twenty years after the Newton yeah. they get around right. to make it a, a right. an iPhone. And and they've never created it. None of their successful products were they the first ones in the category. I mean, correct. There were MP3 players before their iPod. There were there were smartphones before the iPhone. There were certainly tablets before the I, iPad. What they did is simply refined them, made them less complicated to use, and managed to suddenly, you know, enter a market that existed and and excel at it, which is you know what it is. It's the, uh, it's yeah. the Virgin uh, Atlantic model. You know, Virgin does the exact same thing. All they do is take stuff yeah. that already exists and make it exquisitely awesome. You know, uh, mm -hmm. plane flight, transatlantic plane flights were already around. They just added massages and a bar to it. You know, that that's yep. what that's what Apple excels at. Are you going to, uh, you know what you really need to do is get the new $45,000 suite. Yeah. Did you see this? Airlines. Uh, uh, no. what, what is the airline? It's a, it's an Abu Dhabi Airlines. Yeah. Etihad or Etihad. Yeah. E-T-I-H-A-D, I think. Are you uh, the suite on the plane? Well, it's a, one of those uh, 380s or the, you know, the big Airbuses. And mm -hmm. actually there's a guy trying to raise money on Kickstarter, a travel, a travel writer. <laughs> Trying to raise money on Kickstarter to buy this uh, a passage on this, uh, it is. Let me see if I can find it here. Um, it is a um, uh, three room suite on the airplane. Oh my god! <laughs> How many people can you bring in? Uh, only two, and oh, it's wow. forty five thousand dollars for a seven hour flight for two people. Uh, let me well, just compared to pri flying private, it's probably a good deal. They call it the residences on this plane, the A380. Uh, you get a shower stall, you get a living room, and you get a bedroom. And so wait a minute, we're looking at a this guy Kickstarter wants for to, a guy who wants to ride that. He wants to. Yes, he needs. He's trying to raise money. He's a travel <laughs> writer. <laughs> Don't Not knock it. He's got money. 476 <laughs> backers. He's raised thirteen thousand dollars towards his twenty five thousand. Yeah, this sounds like something like me and Justin would put together. This seems ridiculous that he's actually trying to raise money for this. Wait till you see this thing, though. I'm going to back it, I think. I, 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 I'm, uh, it's I the first it multi-room suite ever released on a commercial airplane. Uh, yeah, wouldn't you, wouldn't you, don't you want Evan Schlappig, I'm sorry, Ben <laughs> Schlappig, that's his name, to Ben Schlappig to get to ride on this plane? He's written you know, them on... The the reason why I wouldn't spend it, besides the fact that I don't have forty five thousand dollars to throw away, no, no, you give him a buck. It, that's all. Give him a buck. No, 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 I mean, no. In terms of this whole idea, the the beauty of flying private, and occasionally I, I have the, you know, I have friends who have private planes. Occasionally I get to, is that you don't have to go through security. You just drive up to the plane. Yeah, you don't you, get and, that and benefit. Get no, that's. I don't think you would get that benefit in this deal. And so for me, I mean, forty two thousand maybe, but forty five thousand. You could probably. I don't think so. The problem fly you know, the problem private here is for it's that only. Place. It, well, no, it's you can fly it's private for that hours. price. I would like, think. Private private can't fly like Trans Pacific. Like if this uh. was. If this was going like to Taipei, for example, I mean, I'm going to go to San Francisco next week. You would love this, wouldn't you? Twelve hour flight. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think in that case, that's where, that's why I'm I, the most. I mean, I'm kind of an air travel geek. Um, well, there, I, we, we got the perfect person here. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I, I don't know that much about it, but I, the thing that surprises me the most about this product is it's on such a short route. Um, a seven hour but, route. Uh, yeah. Right. Where, where it is actually competing with private air travel. So you go up the stairs. <laughs> To your private. Now, this is just first class. Don't get excited. Okay, now we're going to... Ah, that's not bad first class. <laughs> the door wow. closes. The TV comes on. You relax. The What are those? Eglo coolers? What are those? Those those open up and you could put your shoes in there. And then here's your shower. Your private shower. Walk through there. And I don't know what else is in here. Oh, here's your bedroom. Double bed. Wow, look at that bed. Oh, yeah. Double bed, of course. Yeah. Wow. Lots of room. And I'm still stuck on this for the mile high club, it's thing. Yeah. It's like, uh, you know what, Leo? I'm sorry. Announcing right now, I'm going to record a webcam video of myself that I'll post on GoFundMe <laughs> to raise enough money to make a decent Indiegogo video that all will raise me even more money for a Kickstarter video to go for a ride on this. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> there you go. Bootstrap. It's all about bootstrapping. That's I, very I want to ride on, we, uh, we, talk, we talked about marketing. I mean, like, how many people on this show knew what Etihad Air, Airways it's was? It's good for Etihad. It's good for Ben so. Schlappig. Uh, it will operate from <laughs> Abu Dhabi to London Heathrow starting December 2014. I'm there. I I want to give the guy some money just because of his chutzpah. <laughs> Speaking of chutzpah. I don't know if chutzpah is a word for that particular route, but that's okay. <laughs> Hi. Oh, look at her. I'm here, and you are in your residence. Come have dinner. 
She seems awfully perky. Uh, she have to share it with her? Because I don't think they want to. Or traveling by private jet. The residence by Etihad has a the VIP residence. travel concierge, and they will organize everything for you from a luxury limousine, private check-in and lounge, and when you oh, arrive on board, uh, see? you will be greeted by your butler. Yes, you get a butler. 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 Get out of here. You just lost me. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever one person. I say, hey, sir. <laughs> it's time. The weird thing. It may be there are people who can afford this you yeah. know, in that yeah. in that in that particular route. I mean, yeah. given, given where nobody's they're going. Paying, nobody's paying for this. Everybody's using their, this is the kind of thing you set up so that people can waste their stupid airline miles on it. Nobody actually pays for it. Actually, the best it. thing I is I don't believe it. My suggestion next time, bring a 12 year old, try to get on the get him on the exit row. They're going to come up to you and say, yeah, sorry, you can't sit here, sir. Let's say, all right, I'll take the residence. And then and then and then put yeah, in. Right. Holy cow, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> I this am is mad. Some Last scam story. School stuff right I here, know. Man. Last story great. of the day. I am mad. Senator uh, uh, Le Patrick Leahy of Vermont single handedly, with a tweet, killed patent reform in the Senate. Um, dead. The patent trolls have won. Congress. Wait, uh, what? What? Yes. What? Uh, the Patrick House of Leahy Representatives had good, overwhelmingly approved. Patent reform in December was sent to the Senate. The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Patrick Leahy, s tweeted, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're not going to do this. We don't have the votes. Never mind. Julie, uh, Sam uh, uh, Samuelson, who is, uh, Julie Samuels, who uh, was the former EFF uh, lawyer, uh, is a director of Engine, a group that lobbies for startups, said uh, Tuesday night it was moving forward. Wednesday morning it was moving forward. Then I looked at Twitter there was a tweet saying it was dead. What the hell? Uh, really a surprise. Wait a minute. Now, it's not like Leahy was trying to kill the bill. I'm just reading a little more. But Leahy was Leahy decided because up. he's yeah, the he, chairman he of the committee to table right. it. He right, unilaterally he did it. But he, I don't think he did it because he hates the idea of it. I think he did it because he didn't have the votes to, make, to, to get it to pass, if I'm reading this right. Well, and that's a question. He said we don't have yeah. the votes. Right. Uh, I would have yeah. liked it to have gone a little farther in the process to see. Well, the, 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 the R's technical you just showed is interesting because that's contending that it was actually killed by Harry Reid. Um, and the under pressure from the 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 trial lawyers, uh, trial lawyers. and yeah, big farm. And the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I think uh, which which would be unfortunate. I, I wonder if there's a. Uh, uh, the pharmaceutical industry, I think, is under is certainly understandable, although they tried to accommodate them. I mean, that that's kind of like the poster child for why patents are necessary. Yeah, we need patents. Nobody's um, saying that. What we don't want is software well, patents, and what we don't want is non-practicing right, exactly. entities to go around suing people because it's a good way to make money. Right. Yeah, because Reuters, uh, Reuters right, says that Leahy did not I say can, he was giving up on the bill in order that he still sought to address the problem of patent trolls. Next year. Yeah, so... Yeah, I mean, okay. First of all, yeah. uh, I guess I'll step up. I'll be devil's advocate here. Uh, like, if he didn't have the votes, what's so wrong about saying I don't have the votes? You know, like, like that's just a fact. I assume, right? Yeah, well, I don't think like, the no, the Leahy's not that the, the bad never guy came here. To a vote. That's the issue. The contention it, it was killed. They never by, got out of committee. By lobbying groups. Yeah, right. And yeah. I mean, remember, this passed the House of Representatives by an overwhelming margin. Um, it was supported by the president uh, and. The leadership, the leadership, starting at Harry Reid, killed it. Um, right. And Democrats killed it. Lee Reid and, and Leahy uh, killed it. Um, yeah, the Ars Technica article said that Leahy was just doing Harry Reid's bidding. Harry's, of course, the uh, majority leader. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I do wonder. I do wonder if there would, if there'd be some way to get traction um, in explicitly. I don't know. I don't know if this is possible, but to explicitly split off software from the rest of the patent system that may like, be the solution because then uh, but you know who makes money on these lawsuits really it's the patent it's the lawyers that's who the lawyers that's sure 29 yeah. billion dollars last year and almost all of it went to lawyers uh who yeah, are it's, you, know. a, it's a, you talk about incentives and and like right. it, it's actually a very understandable and what uh, approach for all them they got to do is take 10 percent, give it to congress and uh, everything's fine 
I, it's very disappointing. Very disappointing. I'll tell you what, whenever we run across something like this, I just wish, I, I just want to hear Corey Doctorow talk about it because I remember listening on This Week in Tech, like it must have been three years He's ago. He's the greatest, where isn't he? he? I mean, where, where, where he talked about the whole idea of piracy as, as an intellectual venture and, and uh, uh, in the 1700s and the whole reason we have patent law as it is right now. It's like, I just, I just know in my mental Rolodex, I know that I'm dumb about this and I want to hear somebody smarter. I will get Corey on soon. The problem with Corey is he's in Britain, and unlike Ben, he's not willing to get up early. Or no, I think it's the other way around. It's uh, bedtime for Posey's yeah, daughter. Yeah, the, 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 pro the, problem with the problem with patents is I think everyone, it's the same, just to tie everything again in, in a, a bigger knot or bow, uh, it's a similar thing to, to the surface thing. Like we forgot the whole reason they exist. Right. Like, right. The reason they exist is, is, the 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 people who came up with the idea of patents and and go back to the founding fathers and whatnot like everyone knows patents are a bad thing they reduce competition they make things more expensive uh the reason they exist is that uh they are an artificial monopoly and the reason they exist is it, the fear that if they didn't exist some types of innovation would would not happen and again right. the pharmaceutical is a great example it takes something like seven or eight years to bring something to market and they're trivial to copy. If there weren't patent protection, there would be no point in investing in no, uh, we need patents. seven or eight years. That's but clear. With the, but with the problem is in, in software and technology, like there is no need for additional competitive advantage. There's such an advantage to being first to market. Right. Uh, the whole reason that patents exist in the first place doesn't even apply to technology. And that that's, but it, it's almost, it, I, I wonder if we would get traction by going back to first, first principles. Like, what's the point of patents? Okay, now we all agree that's the point. Then it becomes just super obvious that they don't have a place in software in particular, beyond the fact that, you know, software is math and you can't pot patent math. But well, I felt, that, like we were, I felt like we were getting there, and I felt like this bill was one of the ways we were going to get there, but that's dead. Corey Doctorow, by the way, to answer your question, Brian Brushwood, suggests the Magnificent Seven model. For fighting patent trolls. Go on. It, it actually You're... is kind of like your model. He says, uh, the, you remember in Magnificent Seven, the villagers who are plagued by bandits every year decide instead of giving money to the bandits, let's give it to mercenaries to fight the bandits, the Magnificent yeah, Seven. Yeah. The Seven Samurai and the original. Uh, he says what we need to do is we need to get a Kickstarter together and have all the money that you put in to defend against pa patent trolls Get that together on a Kickstarter, and then we're going to hire, I don't know, Clint Eastwood, Yul Brynner, uh, Steve McQueen, and James Coburn, and they will come and take care of the patent trolls. Essentially, like, create a super fund. A super weirdly. fund. Right? Actually, can I just point you, as long as we're talking about it, May 1, this is, to me, the long-term solution for the whole thing, the Larry Lessig's May 1 campaign, May 1.us. Kickstart fundamental reform by reducing the influence of money in politics. He's raised $1.1 million yeah. to create a super PAC to, to end super all super PACs. And I think it's exactly the right solution. For Larry, you remember, was million. a guy who created Creative Commons. He's yeah. been on this show many times. And he uh, finally realized he's never going to win in anything unless we get the money out of Congress. And uh, by creating a super PAC that would then elect people who would then change, you know, campaign finance reform. We could finally maybe do something. But, it, but if one point one five three million dollars doesn't sound like a lot, a but you know, Congress is cheaper than you think. Huh. <laughs> I think that's the really wow. interesting thing in all of this. It doesn't take a lot of money. So stage two launches next month. Keep the momentum going. If you want to know more, May one m a y o n e dot u s. We are out of time. Thank you, everybody. It's been a great show, Brian Brushwood. Last minute, Brian, we call him. He comes in, <laughs> he rides in out of the sunset, he gets all the bad stories. guys, and then he it's rides my, off. Better than my original ma name, which was Last Place Brian, so I'm <laughs> glad to be Last Minute Brian instead. <laughs> Always a pleasure. Scam, scam, I can't say it, but I, scam stuff. I can type scam it. Scamstuff.com, but that, that's all right. I already got my plug in. You talk to everyone else. At Schwood on the Twitter and Scam School and Cord Killers and uh, Late Night tr Trains. Uh, Late Night Trains is my new uh, uh, <laughs> that's his uh, album cover album. <laughs> night Attack, baby. <laughs> yes, Night Late, Attack. Late night the trains. fortified wine that leaves you feeling fine. <laughs>
Uh, we want to thank Ben Thompson for being here from Stratechery. I've been trying to get you on for ages. I had no idea you were in China. That might have been one of the problems, but I'm glad you got up early today. Oh, boy. You you have no idea the uh, what you just stepped into. I'm, <laughs> I'm in Taiwan. Uh, oh, it's not China. It's dispute. Taiwan. Pardon me. Taiwan. The... <laughs> The Island well, Republic. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to go there. I'll let you. I'll let you do with that. But yes, stratechery.com, <laughs> and then my podcast is uh, exponent.fm. Uh, and, and exponent can, like the math function. So. And you can find that at Stratechery also. And you, it's yeah, brand new. This Twitter. is all, you only have done four episodes. This is exciting. I'm really glad you're doing it. Yeah. No. It, it, and we actually talked. Uh, it's funny you brought up the May one. We the, the last episode was about you know tech and politics. Yeah. And um, yeah. we got to fix this. Yeah. Really a great and then, site. Yeah. And then if you get a membership to the site, you've got, you're doing some interesting stuff. You've got a private glass board, which is a great idea, um, and uh, meetups and all sorts of stuff. So I won't yeah, say no, China do, uh, anymore, but, it, but, it, but you speak Chinese there, don't you? Yes. You have uh, chow mein. Chinese. You have egg foo young. No. Uh, stop. I'm making you stop those, right the, now, the, the, Leo. Those are all like Western constructs, <laughs> yes, right? I know, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah, I was a Chinese major. Chinese. I know all of that stuff. What are you, stuffing your face you have, with your fortune you cookies? You have Guy what Bao, you, you have Char Sil Bao, you have all the good yeah, Bao's. Yeah. I know, it's good food. Now you're talking. <laughs> uh, it's just not that China. It's another China. It's the other China. Uh, no, they, I mean, it's actually, a, it's a great place for food. Because there's, oh, yeah. there's the oh, different yeah. parts of China. But there, uh, the Japanese actually... Uh, controlled the island for the first 50 years of the 20th century. And so there's a heavy Japanese influence. Um, and the Europeans were here before. So it's actually a really interesting um, mix. Uh, and from a culinary perspective, it's it's excellent. One, one of the one of the many advantages of, of living here. I've wanted to go to Computex every year. Maybe this will be the year. Oh, it's next week, so. Yeah, we well, we're going to have to make our plans, plans huh? <laughs> <clears throat> That's a wonderful trade show. Ryan Trout goes every year. Wonderful trade mm -hmm. show. Yeah. Uh, next week, huh? I don't know if we're gonna make it. Yeah, and I, I'm I, I I'm actually gonna miss them too, unfortunately. You're um, coming. You're coming out of here. I am. So. All right. Maybe you can come up yeah. and visit us sometime. Yeah. Well, we we were up there uh, a couple summers ago, um, but I think it was to see Snoopy. Uh, not too. Snoopy's uh, in the to Snoopy's the in the ranch. neighborhood. Snoopy's just up yes. the road a bit, a piece. Nice to see you. Thank you, Ben, for joining us. Come back soon. Thank you to Larry Magid, CBS Radio, Safe Kids. Dot org. Anything else you com, want to dot com. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, if you go to safekids.com right now, you'll see it's today's it's ch um, Missing Children's Day. And so I just have a little piece up there about the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Everybody ought to know about that if you don't already. So um, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, no, yeah something, to, something, to, something to think about and realize that there are still kids that need to be brought home. It is also Towel Day. Not, wow. to, not to make Missing Children's Day less important. A towel day. I didn't know that. <laughs> but it is towel day, and uh, that's an important day. It's uh, It was created in 2001, two weeks after the death of Douglas Adams. Uh, he passed away uh, May 11th, 2001. And <laughs> to honor him, honor Hitchhiker's Guide and his brilliant writing, his great sense of humor, uh, his fans, many of his fans got together and created Towel Day, which is celebrated May 25th every year for the last 13 mm -hmm. years. We wore towels on the screensavers on May 25th, 2001. And John is wearing his towel today. I've got mine in my pocket. It's a very tiny towel. Uh, but thanks to every <laughs> Somebody apparently wants to turn this into National Geek Day as well, because it's towel day. Eh, that's mm -hmm. fine with me. That's just geeksist. Come on, man. <laughs> Let the towels geeksist. have towel day. Let the towels have their own day. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We do Twit uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2200 UTC. 6 a.m. Taiwan time. If you, want, <laughs> if you want to join us, we'd love to see you live. It's great fun to have you in the chat room, but if you can't be there, don't worry. We make on-demand audio and video available right after the show at twit.tv and wherever you can find your favorite netcasts, including iTunes. And, of course, we've got great apps. If you don't have the Twit app, and we don't do them, but wonderful third-party developers do them for iOS, uh, Android, Windows Phone, get the Twit app. You won't miss an episode that way. If you'd like to be in studio uh, with us, you, free snacks for some of you. Not all of you. <laughs> some of you get free snacks. And all you got to do more is... Than, more than your guest gap. <laughs> that was a little bit weird. It's like like free snacks. Uh, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> Barry gets free get snacks. A, I don't yeah. even get a $5 discount on my razor. So, um. <laughs> Tickets at twit.tv. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you. What? What?
Oh, I didn't do any of the house ads at all. Well, I'm going to let you guys go while we find out what a great week it was because we did have fun this week on uh, on Twit. Previously on Twit, tech news tonight. Our top story tonight, Microsoft is unveiling the Surface Pro 3. As impressive as it is, a very niche device. I mean, how many people want to spend premium dollars for what's essentially a very, very thin ultrabook? Marketing Mavericks. I was impressed with exactly how honest the Times was with itself. It breaks my heart how many companies have taken social media and have simply used it as another mass marketing, mass advertising platform instead of using it for what it's good at. Listening to what your customers want. Triangulation. Our final invention, artificial intelligence, and the end of the human era. Holy cow. Here's a sort of a litmus test of how good AI has become. Look at the jobs it's displacing. Tech news today. eBay got hacked. That's right, the company posted a statement urging users to change their passwords. Well, one thing we know is that they were able to penetrate the eBay and internal corporate network. Twit Live specials. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, and I'm at Maker Fair 2014, Woo! the biggest show and tell on Earth. Twit, tech just like you like it. All that in one week. And what 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 will net next week bring? Let's see. We've got coming to, up in the week ahead. Recode's first ever conference begins Tuesday, May twenty seventh, in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. It's called the Code Conference, but it's not for developers. A three day event is being hosted by the same people who used to run all things D, Walt Mossberg and Kara Swisher. Also this week, Samsung's throwing a big healthcare technology event on Wednesday, May twenty eighth, right before in Apple's event. The company isn't planning to announce new consumer products, but the event is expected to address healthcare features in future Samsung smartphones and wearables. Later that day, NBC anchor Brian Williams is scheduled to interview NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden in Moscow. And Samsung's planning to roll out its gold Galaxy oh. S5 in the United States on Friday, May 30th. The phone is nicknamed the Band-Aid phone because its color and perforations make it look like a Band-Aid. We'll see if the name sticks. Back to you, Leo. I has opulence. I has a gold phone. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll see you another uh, time, uh, maybe next week. Another this twit is, is in the can. Thank you.